Well, hey there, this is Brian Knight from PragmaticWorkMonday.com to boost your team's- And I am, uh, I am joined today with uh, Nate. Hey, Nate, welcome. Uh, hey. Nate will be helping me with the questions in the back area here. Uh, so if you have any questions, as you ask them, you see uh, Nate uh, responding. I think, what Nate, what is your handle on, on, on uh, YouTube? Uh, power to the people is how you'll know I'm responding to your question. All right, sounds good. Thank you, Nate, for joining us today. And thank you for joining us today also. So first of all, uh, I have a quick uh, uh, introduction slide here for us, and then we'll jump right into it. We have a very hands-on session today. Luckily, because this is on YouTube, of course it is being recorded, and you will be able to also pause me. I speak fast. So you can pause me at any time and get your systems caught up in my systems and play it back whenever you wish. So my name is Brian Knight. I'm the uh, Power Apps MVP out of Jacksonville, Florida here, uh, Northeast Florida. And uh, I basically means I do a lot of videos and books and content around Power Apps. I'm also the founder of Pragmatic Works. We focus on training around the Power Platform, and we focus on training around Azure and uh, the rest of the SQL Server side as well. I've authored 18 books on the topic around data warehousing and Power BI and all of that. I usually can sell those outside the abandoned blockbuster videos on weekends. Uh, I sell them next to the guy who sells the pit bulls. So you'll see me there this weekend in case you're curious. And then lastly, I blog at pragmaticworks.com. Uh, Nate will be taking uh, your questions today and, and ones that are, are especially cool, he'll be adding those to my queue today where I can answer those uh, in, you know, in, in the right in slide line here today as well. A few things to note. First of all, um, there is a, some notes I'll be using today. And Nate, well, would you mind putting us in the chat window also? Uh, some notes I'll be using today, uh, you see on the screen right now. Uh, this is just some little crib notes. It's the way of me passing code to you. There's also a whole lab manual you can give as well. That's in the comments I've are in the uh, description of this video. Uh, that could be used later, but it's a little guide you can use to kind of learn more about the Power Platform inside of Teams. But this link that you see right below me, oh, right, oh, there we go, somewhere over there. Uh, that, that link right there will basically get you a My Little Crib notes that I have on my side and you can kind of use to kind of uh, save you some time typing in some code later also. So let's begin. All right, I'm gonna go that route instead. I think that's a little cleaner. Okay, so why would we use the Power Platform inside of Teams? Well, first of all, what is it? Well, the Power Platform has uh, four major components inside of Teams. The first one, of course, is Power Apps. That's where we're gonna start with today. The Power Apps uh, platform allows you to build the same type of Canvas applications you do in main Power Apps, but you can essentially do it for free. Inside of Power and Power Platform inside of Teams, there is a, a, a two gig version of Dataverse inside of each team that you may decide to use. So inside of each team, you can have two gigs of data and up to a million records in a table. So that combination gives you a free version of Dataverse that you can use. So we'll talk about why that might be important later. So on the Power App side, you can build beautiful applications and host them right inside of Power Apps. On the Power Automation side, all of this comes in included in your Teams license today. So if you're already a Teams shop, you get all of this included in that license. On the Power Automate side, for this one, you can do your approvals, you can do your automations and all of that included in there. You can also host virtual agents. These virtual agents allow you to uh, host things like that, to, to ask questions, like how do I reset my password and the things that you might need internally. Now keep in mind, typically virtual agents cost a lot of money, but now you can host it inside of Teams. As long as you're using the basic features of it, uh, you can use it. Uh, you can also expand it and get upgraded to other features, but this is all included in your license too. And then lastly, Power BI, you can host Power BI reports right inside Teams also. So that's the what. Now, there's a number of ways you can install like uh, solutions that are ready-made for your, for your company. You can make ready-made solutions, or you can find great templates that are available to you as well. So if you want to do things like inspections or process improvements or those types of things, those are all included as ready-made solutions with one click or you can build something for the organization they can install in one click and then allow them to basically install your bits of code into their teams so build it one time and use it many times 
to go through the process of actually administering this. This is typically turned on by default, but there is a URL that you might want to have your administrators go to. You'll see it right below me now. This URL walks you through the process of turning it on if it's off. Again, it's on by default. So somebody had to uh, proactively go out there and remove it. But when you go to this URL, you can create different sets of policies saying who can go through and actually uh, uh, use the Teams applications and who cannot build Teams applications and Power Platform. So you get the luxury of doing that. Again, that URL is right below me. It's in the admin center for Teams. And all it looks like, it looks like what we're seeing, oh, not there. I may have closed it now. That's okay. Uh, but you'll see that in the sphere it is right there. So once I go to my team site here, you can see again, the URL is right below me. I can create, I have a global policy, which in my case allows all applications, but I can also block or allow certain applications also there as well. You can get very, very granular with that policy. But from an IT administration side, you do have the governance to say who can use this and who cannot use it. And it looks like uh, this right there. Sorry about that. I forgot to show that. Here we go. So we can see that in this case that I can go ahead and allow all applications by default and then turn it off if I wanted to as well. So either way, we have that luxury there. And you can go back and create up multiple policies and assign different members to each policy. So you might have a list of teachers, for example, that you want to be able to create apps and the students, you don't want to create the apps. All you'd have to do there is create multiple policies, one for each to basically comply with that. All right, let me go and close that and close that. There we go. Now, <clears throat> our final slide here is what is included and what is not included. I mentioned before that when you do Dataverse inside of this, each team that you install Dataverse into gets up to a million records in the table and up to two gigs of data. That's the first volume metric piece for you. Now, it's not like it's a hard stop. If you, if you go over that, they're not gonna stop you hard out of the box there, but you can go through and, and uh, upgrade that at any point in time. So what does this give us? Well, first of all, it gives us all the chatbots and the automations and the apps all built into that. We can embed those right into Teams. The pro and con is now if your, your users are very you know, adamant team users, these apps are all hosted in Teams. So you will no longer have to use the Power Apps application. You'll use a Teams application to access those applications or in, and flows and the such. Additionally, at one point, you can say, hey, I don't want to see this in Teams. I want to go ahead and put and see this on a website also. You can do that once you open up the app also. But at any point, we can upgrade this to full-blown Teams, a full-blown Dataverse if we so chose also. So you can start small and always upgrade with one click there as well. So also, if you decide, if you're using the Power Apps in Teams, for example, or Power Automate in Teams, it is included in your team's license until you use a premium connector. Typically though, Dataverse is considered a premium connector, but in Teams, as long as you're using the Teams Dataverse, it's included in that license that you have there as well. So that's the, the pro and the con there. Whenever you're ready though, you can upgrade that to full-blown Dataverse. I'll show you where that's at in a moment here also. The last thing to keep in mind is they've kind of simplified Dataverse as part of this also. What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is, is there is not the same types of tables you get with full-blown Dataverse. You're not going to get, for example, the contacts table and the account table to hold companies. You're going to have to engineer that yourself. The security has been simplified also. So the security is one click to secure your table to where people can only see their own data. Now in full-blown Dataverse, you get a lot more flexibility there. You can say, hey, uh, Nate, you can see your own data. Um, Brian, you can see anyone in your business unit's data. And hierarchically, data, you can see security there as well. So where I can see any data for any department underneath me. So there's lots of different flexibility points with full-blown Dataverse. You also get model-driven apps in full-blown Dataverse. And right now, those are not in Teams at the time of this recording, at least. Or, well, right now, it's a live event. So uh, right now, as of October, it's only Canvas applications. So that's a few of the pieces around that. 
But again, if you want to use SQL Server or Oracle, at that point, it does require a premium license at that point. All right. So the last piece to kind of mention, kind of uh, as we're thinking about this, is if you're looking at comparing this to SharePoint applications, which would make sense here? Well, if you're looking at, at building an app in SharePoint, and let's imagine I have an app out there for a salary increase. You know, I want to go ahead and, and allow people to uh, request uh, that one of their employees is going to get a 10%, 5%, whatever that increase might be. I go to that app, I fill it in, and it saves that record to SharePoint waiting for an approval. In this example, because I have access to the Power app, I also have to have access to the, to the SharePoint list as well. And if I have access to that SharePoint list, by theory, I can go and approve my own request. Not only that, I can see everybody else's salary request by default also. This is where Teams shines. Teams is going to be more performant. It's going to have less things like called delegation errors. We're not going to, we'll talk about that in a moment here. It will perform better than SharePoint. SharePoint usually tops out about 20,000 rows. Yes, you can fit 30 million rows in a SharePoint list, but 20,000 is more the list where things become more tight and rigid. It also is going to be more secure, where I can make sure that Nate can only see his own record and his own salary request. Those are two big reasons that if I'm looking at a SharePoint app, I typically look at Teams instead. We could split the difference. We could say, I'm going to store my files inside of SharePoint and my low priority data in SharePoint, and put my high priority data in Teams also. So you can kind of have your cake and eat it too there also. So what is our agenda for today? A little bit late here on this, but our agenda for now is we're going to do a little mini hackathon. Again, because we're on YouTube, you can play along with me. Pause me and kind of play me. We're going to build an application that is for contract uh, request. So I want to onboard a new vendor and request a, that a contract be approved by procurement. So that's my goal, and that's a really small scope. Of course, normally we'd have a lot larger scope with this time of application, but we're building this to, to, to last us a, a three-hour session today. So we have a nice longer session, and we will do a break about an hour and a half in. So right around uh, 1230 or so East Coast time, we'll take a quick 10-minute uh, break just to kind of get your legs stretched, reset your, your uh, energy level, and then we'll, be, we'll begin again right after that. Thir actually, 15 minutes, excuse me. All right, so from this point forward, it's all demos. So go ahead and get your, your sleeves rolled up and let's play together now. Again, just to make sure I, if in case you're joining me late, the uh, URL for my demos is right below me. Oh, right there, excuse me. Oh, there we go, right there. You can find my, our, my, my demo script right there. It's very, it's only a one pager. But I wanted to find a way to kind of get some code over to you uh, without having to put it in the chat window and do that. You can also type the code if you're feeling especially adventurous. And I believe Nate's going to put that URL in the chat window for you guys also. All right. So let's begin. Let me go ahead and get rid of that. All right. There we go. And uh, let us let me first of all show you where you can find out uh, how much team space you have available to you. So to start with, we're going to go ahead and do two things. We're going to create our team, if you, if you have access to it, of course. We're then going to go ahead and build our Dataverse on that team. And then we're going to go, go away for a few minutes and, sh and see in the admin center what's happening. Okay. Then we'll come back and actually create our first tables and our application on top of that. If you've never done Power Apps before, no worries. I'm going to walk you from the ground up today on that Canvas application. This is really a, a one or a 200 level session, not a super advanced session, okay? So let's try this, first of all. So I'm gonna go ahead and, I, I, have a, I don't have a team ready for this. So I'm gonna create one from scratch. If you have one already ready, absolutely, just feel free to use that. Use your, your regular personal team site or whatever you want. But I'm gonna go ahead and go to the left side. I'm gonna hit create, I'm gonna go to Teams right here. And then once I go to Teams, I'll click on this Create a Team at the bottom. If you don't see that link at the bottom, it's because you don't have permissions to create teams. And that's absolutely fine also. You can go ahead and create uh, your, your Dataverse on an existing team if you'd like instead. But I'm going to create a brand new team just for me to play with today. I'll go ahead and um, keep this as a regular team. So I'll hit this Create a Team. 
I'm going to do it from scratch. Again, your screens might look a little different based on if you're an educator or if you're working at college or manufacturing, they might have different templates available for you. But I'm going to do a from a scratch here and then I'll do private. This is me playing along right now. And I'll call this just YouTube webinar, uh, you know, learn with the uh, nerds. You call it whatever you want, doesn't matter. And then I'll hit create. This will take about 30 seconds to create. It's also gonna ask me what members should be part of the team right here. I'm gonna skip that for the time being to make it where, um, uh, where only certain people need to do it in this case. Now, as I mentioned before, we have a question that, again, we had a question earlier. As we're doing this, this uh, Dude Gaming asked a question, can I connect SQL Server data source with Power Apps for Teams? And you can absolutely do that. You can use all the connectors that you use in regular Power Apps inside of Teams. But a word of warning here, uh, once you do that, you are in premium land. So you are considered a, a premium license there instead of the, so the free license of Power Apps. All right, my, my team has now been created. My next step, is I need to find out where this is at. So if I hit that little dot, dot, dot right here, okay. Somebody say that the URL did not work. Nate, would you mind testing that URL there, please? Let me test it real quick. I, 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 I when I've come out, learn Teams PP. Uh, it, is, it is case sensitive, by the way. So make sure you do all lower case on that URL as well. I'm seeing some people having issues, but make sure you uh, yeah, copy it into a new tab and keep it all lowercase. Okay. So, all right. So now that we have that, uh, I'm going to go to the left side and I'm going to search for Power Apps. So look on the left side here and go to that little dot, dot, dot. I already have mine pinned, but in my case, I'm going to hit the little dot, dot, dot and search for Power Apps. There it is. Once you find it, Click on it. Now, again, your IT administration staff might have disabled this using those instructions I did earlier. And if not, no worries, just kind of hang out with us and watch and watch us uh, go to town here. I'm gonna select that Power Apps, and that's gonna add the little, little icon that you see right here. A few words of warning from, from personal experience. I've been doing this since the early days of, of this, which has been out about two years now. One of the gotchas is if you're in the middle of building an app, and you get a chat in, your instinct is to click on that chat, right? And start going to that chat. Now, if you do that, what's going to happen is it will leave your app builder and eventually it'll time you out and you're gonna lose your work that you've been working so hard to build. So one word of warning that one thing that I always do is first of all, oh, where did my, my screen go? There it is, my mouse. There it is. That's weird, my mouse just went away. I can right click and say pop out application. So that way if a chat comes in, uh, it, would not, it would not use that. Additionally, we can also go through and we can uh, pin it. So it's always there as well. So those are two things that I, I typically do there as part of that. That's weird, my mouse just went away. All right, so anyways, I'll use a little imagination here. Uh, now that we've got that ready, we're gonna hit the start now button that you see right here. The Start Now button is going to install Dataverse inside of the team that I just created. So I'll hit Start Now. There we go. I'm going to search for that YouTube one that I just created. There we go. I think it's called this one right here. And I'll hit Create. Now, this process might take a good five to 10 minutes to do its thing. We're going to do some shortcuts here, hopefully. We also have almost 2,500 people registered for this webinar right now. So we might see this take a little bit longer because Microsoft not, may, not, may not be used to, you know, two or 3,000 people hitting that button all at the same time. I just got a notice saying it's successful, though. And then once it finishes this, it's going to install Dataverse and then open up the designer to build our first application. There we go. So starting to build that now. Now, while it's doing its thing here, I'm gonna go back out and let me find my mouse here. It's really hard to find a mouse when I can't see it here. I think it's my zooming tool here. It's messing me up. All right, let me just find a, a browser here. Okay, what I was hoping to do is, I can't see my, 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 my mouse though, so let me just go ahead and go up here and I can see it. All right, I'm gonna drag that down. So close. 
All right. I did, I, you expect for all the worst stuff to happen, but you don't expect to lose your mouse. That's the biggie. And I get it when I go back up there. This is the nature of a live event, right? There we go. And there's a hundred ways to skin this cat. There we go. Uh, you guys can see my mouse, but I can't even see it. That's interesting. All right. So, so I'm going to go to make.power apps. And I just want to show you what's happening while it builds this app out. If I were to hit the gear box in the top right and then go to admin center, and you don't have to do this, just kind of watch this for a second here. This opens up the, the admin center for Microsoft. And what's happening now under environments is it has basically created this webinar environment that I just created as a Microsoft team. At any point, this is a Microsoft team environment, but at any point, I can select the three dot here and I can upgrade it to full blown Dataverse if I want. Additionally, if I'm looking up top here, I can go on the left side, go to resources and capacity, and then go to Microsoft Teams up top. And I can see all the teams that are using Dataverse at the very bottom, even if I'm not an admin, I can see how much Dataverse space I have. Now we're a smaller company, you know, got 30 employees or so, but some in some companies, I've, I've looked at one last week, they had nine terabytes of Dataverse space available to them. So you'll see there's a lot of options you have here, but if I go ahead and zoom out there, there we go. So this will show you how you can kind of see how much capacity you have for this. In my case, I can have one more team available, one, one more available to actually do this with. And I have uh, roughly 20 gigs of space. All right, so let me go back over to my, um, my area that was in before, teams, there we go. Now, <clears throat> that was a stall technique. And it was a stall technique because uh, I knew this was gonna spin and spin and spin. I tested this numerous times last night, and all I got was a stinking spinner right here. You might be seeing um, seeing a, an actual app come up, the, the main Power Apps designer. What I found I had to do, uh, and this is this is for some reason it's a new environment. Oh, there, there it goes. It's actually working. What I have found I had to do is wait for long enough, I guess. But eventually it comes open, and if you're patient enough, and it will it will ask me what I want to name this application. If it did not come up, an alternative is hit that build button up top that you're seeing right there and then hit new app that way. But I'm going to stop there and just use the way it was intended here. All right. So we're going to go ahead and build the application. So I'm going to go ahead and give it a better name. Right now it's just called app. So I'll call this just contracts, contract management app or something like that. You call it whatever you want. This is just a throwaway application today and then hit the save button after that. This will take about 10 seconds to build the application for you. And as it does it, there we go. As it does it, it's basically creating this new app in the Dataverse. Now, we're gonna show you two ways of building this application today. One way is going to be with, let me actually see real quickly here. Uh, one way is with data. And the other way is gonna be the old traditional way that we, we build applications uh, with Canvas apps. So let's start with the first way. I want a way of, of adding new vendors into my system. So we have two tables we're going to create, one for vendors and one for contracts. The vendor one, very simple. Just show me the vendor's name. So not much to it at all. The second one though, will be the contracts for those vendors. So a really simple application here, two tables only. All right, so for your first table, if I look down here, once the app comes open, again, feel free to pause me if yours is still spinning. Okay, it's completely normal. It sometimes takes a while to, for it to create its thing here. Okay. All right. In my case, I'm going to go ahead and hit with data. And it's asking what table do I want to communicate with? Now, this will be for screen one. This, this screen is truly going to be a throwaway screen, but I want to show you how fast you can build a Power App inside of Teams. So as I look at this, I'm gonna create a brand new table, and this is where my notes come handy. My brand new table is gonna be called Vendor, and I'll hit Create. Okay. Once it does that, let me go ahead and really quickly here. 
It's going to create that table. And as you can see, it's asked me to go ahead and create some data. I can go through now and, and, and select these columns and edit the columns and add more columns, just like you can in regular Dataverse. Keep in mind, Dataverse is basically a SQL Server database behind the scenes. All right. And I'll go ahead and create a few vendors. I'll call this Nate's Crappy Car Inc. There we go. One vendor. And then I'll have Brian's Luxury Cars. There we go. Okay, good enough. And we can keep on going, creating vendor two and vendor three and so on and so on. Now, this table that we're seeing right here of data is a Dataverse table. It's a SQL Server table behind the scenes called a vendor. And we can migrate that from, from environment to environment, or we can migrate this from team to team if we wanted to as well. Now, if you've got a question here we got from, uh, from Felix here is, uh, sorry, Phoenix, uh, on Teams it says it is locked out and may need approval, request approval. Yes, so that is because your IT team has ultimately locked you out of, of creating a new team or creating a new Power App in Teams. You just have to seek approval for that. Um, it's, it's generally on by default, but if you work at a larger company, they may have turned that off in this case. So once you have a few records created, we're not going to add any more columns, but once you have those few records created, hit that close button in the bottom left. And what's going to happen now is it's going to create the application for you to build all that out. Okay. So give it a few seconds there and it's build a okay looking application. It's, it's not the best looking, but we can make it look a little prettier now. All right, so as we do this, we can see our application has a number of, it's all containerized, meaning that it's already, it's already uh, friendly for being responsive. In other words, if I were to play this application by hitting that play button right here, we can see that it basically goes through and it's responsive. It, it, it shrinks or expands based on how much of my resolution on my screen looks. So pretty handy. All right, so let me go ahead and say no to that. Next, now that we've got that, our next step is we wanna kind of clean this up just a little bit. So for example, on the left side here, we have something called a gallery. A gallery is a way you're gonna show data in a Canvas applications. So we'll go ahead and clean this up in just a moment. And we're also gonna put a little header bar up top clean that up, and then we're going to build one from scratch next. This is the equivalent of building an application from a wizard here, though. So pretty handy. Now, let's kind of give you a quick rundown of the environment. On the left side is your tree view. And this tree view shows you all the components that are in your application. So notice it, it's creating everything with containers. These containers make it where, so if I select it, it builds a big box around it. These containers allow you to go through and make it responsive, where it shrinks or expands based on your resolution. Additionally, that's a tree view. The next the option down is a plus button. This plus button shows you all the components that are available to you. Next item down is the data. This data shows me, it allows me to create new tables, allows me to link out to SharePoint, for example, or Office 365 or SQL Server or wherever you wish to go. That's the add data option. Next option down is a list of all the uploads. I can upload my logo, uh, upload any kind of sound or videos or those kind of things. Power Automate is right here where I can add new flows and I can reference those flows inside this area. And then lastly, there's an edit replace where I can find certain pieces and change their name or I wanna change all the fonts from A to B. I can do that in my edit replace. Okay, so question we got, what is the maximum number of Dataverse for Teams environments? It really depends, right? So look in your resource and capacity area I showed you before. This is a question from Don, and you'll see it'll show you how much capacity you have at your company. For me, it's 20, but I had one the other day that had 40,000 uh, Teams available with, uh, with Power Apps for Teams. So it really depends on, on the company and, and how much space you have. All right, that's the left area. So I'm gonna to go to the left side. I typically keep this tree view opened all the time. Next, you'll see a few areas up top. I have the same areas you saw on the side up top as well. And this is all contextual based on what I've selected. So now I'm seeing my background color. 
Now I'm seeing my fields. So it's all based on what I select. This is my app in the middle that it's basically chosen. Right here on the right side is the same thing. So for the screen, screen one, here is my properties for screen one. For this icon, here are my properties for this icon, and so on and so on and so on. A few things to note here. Just because you know Power Apps, this is using a, a slightly new uh, information, not new um, uh, controls that are different than what you may be used to at make.powerapps.com. So for example, one of the controls, like the text label you're seeing right here, I use this all the time, it's text label, and I would say, hey, I wanna turn my fill color on. Notice, as you, you scroll up, uh, this one does have a fill color. However, if I were to insert a new label right here, just a random label, don't do this, you'll notice that the fill color is not here. So things like that are, and these new modern controls do not work. I can always turn them on by going to settings and you'll be able to search under upcoming features for classic and it will show me I can get all the old controls back that way. Okay, I had to kind of zoom in for some reason to close out. All right, now the last piece of kind of orientation that I wanna show you here is once you select on the left side, this gallery right here, for example, and I wanna change a property on the right side, or on the, up top here of this gallery. A few things to note. There's this drop down box here, right here, showing us every component that we, or every little object that we can change in this gallery. So this is all the properties for the gallery. Right now, for example, you'll see I have the items property selected. Show me what items are gonna be shown in this gallery. A gallery is a way of showing rows of data. All right, so this is called the property drop down box. When I refer to this later today, hopefully we're on the same page, you'll know what I mean when I say property dropdown box. That means go top left, look for that, and you'll change the code right here. The other little piece of orientation is if I click on an item in my code, you'll get a little down arrow. It will show you what's inside of here, and there's my three companies right there I can see as well. So we can see the impact of code as I type it against this vendor table, uh, by hitting the down arrow and selecting certain things in there. All right, now, additionally, by the way, you'll notice that when I select my gallery, there's a few rules of galleries. So remember the, remember the Fight Club? The first rule of, of Fight Club is nobody talks about Fight Club. Well, in, in Gallery Club, nobody talks about Gallery Club because it's just boring, but I'm gonna do it right now. So the first rule of Gallery Club is if you select the first record and move it around, every record underneath it will move. That's your template. The second rule is if I select the second, third, fourth, whatever row after that, it picks the entire gallery. So if you want to change the properties of a given cell, like this one right here, I make sure you select your first record only. So watch this. I'm gonna go grab this and I'm gonna add an icon. There we go, I'll pick any icon here. Notice that it added it outside the gallery. So this is one of the gotchas. You wanna drag that, it's a little different than what you're used to. You gotta drag that icon into the first record. Otherwise, it will not work. So I mean, let's search for, I'll just grab a button, for example, and drag it right in that first record. Then it adds it for every record underneath it. And I can move it around however I wish. But if I drag it into the gallery, like this button again, just drag it down to the gallery, it just shows one time. That's one of the little rules that you got to keep in mind here. The other thing to keep in mind is if I select the entire gallery, I don't really care about an image of Nate's crappy cars. I would select my entire gallery, and on the right side, there is a layout over here. This layout allows me to configure how do I want this, this, this laid out. And if I just change the title instead of title, image, and all that, it will just show me the names of the companies right there. So pretty snazzy. Lastly, we can go ahead and select some of these areas like these two right here. And I can go in and actually make a background color up top. I could put different themes on it if I wanted to. So I can go ahead and strike a theme of some sort. Some of these are better than others, okay? Uh, we can also go through and let me find a little darker theme here. I, I like the, all right, let's go with that one, that's fine. We can also go through and for that little cell up top here, we can go through and set up the color for it. 
So what I typically do is I'll look at the container, go to the right side, and you'll see a color on the right side, or you can pick whatever color you wish. All right. The only bad thing about the color is my, my icons got kind of washed out. So I can go to my right side, select my four icons, one, two, three, four. I can multi-select them by holding down the shift key and selecting all those icons. And then set the color for those to be like a white or something that makes a little more sense. And now you should be able to see all the icons. All right, we can spend a lot of time building this out and printing this up and, and making it look a little bit nicer. But I think this is good enough for now. Again, I'm going to hit the play button. You'll notice here it's a pretty functional application where I can go through and create new records. I can go into uh, Nate right here. There we go. I can go to Nate and call. Uh, say, oh, I forgot to make it uh, hit the little pencil icon to edit Nate. There we go. And I can call this, you know, whatever I want. And then as I hit the little checkbox, we'll see Nate's record is now Nate's Crappy Ink, uh, Crappy Cars Ink, whatever I want. We can also go through and select certain vendors and also delete them the same way. So all this app is very, very functional. So it's going to give me a little confirmation. Are you sure you want to delete? Yes, I am. And the record is now gone from the database. OK, so this is screen one. Very, very basic was created from a wizard. Now we're ready to actually get a little deeper into screen two now. So let me go ahead and, and do one quick thing. Let's see if I can get my mouse back. Because unfortunately, you guys can see it, but I cannot. I'm going to close Zoom it and see if that wakes it up. It does not. No worries. All right, I'll put Zoom it back on again. All right, there we go. All right. So, so I apologize, guys. I'm having to zoom in so much. I, unfortunately, you guys can see the mouse, but I cannot. So now that we've got our, our basic application done, let's create our second screen. And our second screen is going to be a lot more robust and will control the whole user experience. But before we do anything at all, make sure that you save the application up in the top right. You'll see there's two icons in the top right. One is for saving and one is for publishing. There are different operations. Every time you save, your users cannot see the application until you publish that application, the changes that you may have made. So you could be working on version 20 of the app, and your users are still seeing version 1 of the app. And then once you're ready, you hit the Publish button, and then that will push that into Teams uh, so they can see it right inside Teams. We'll show the Publish a little bit later, but for the time being, just hit that Save button up in the top right. Okay? Awesome. Now that we've got that, let's create our second screen. To do the second screen on the left side in the tree view, so make sure you go to your tree view, and on the left side, you'll hit New Screen. I'm going to make this, instead of a, a pre-laid out one like we have right now, I'll make this a blank screen. And we're going to create this a little bit more difficult way. So you'll see I'm working on screen three. I'm not sure why it's screen three, but whatever. Uh, so, and I can, now when I hit play, whatever screen is on top is the one that's going to be opened up by default at least. So I could move up screen three up top or whatever your, whatever your name is, the second screen up top. And now this is the screen that your users will be dumped in by default. Okay. All right. So let's build this one from scratch. So we're not going to use the start, start the screen section in the middle. We're going to build it from the ground up this time. Now to start with, we want our header bar up top. Okay. Now a few, uh, a great question here from Arthur here as well. A few of you guys are getting a little bit sluggish experience inside of, of Teams. Uh, now this is, uh, I, I find this uh, pretty frequently for the developer. You as a developer, Arthur, might see a little slowdown occasionally. They are working on that. Uh, this is where I always make sure you save frequently. And I also use the web experience, teams.microsoft.com, usually to build my stuff. And I have a little better experience with that sometimes. However, I have not seen the experience where your users are going to have issues. Just, uh, just you as a developer might have an issue with that. Okay? So just a, a quick, quick uh, differentiator there on that. So thanks for asking that question, Arthur. All right. Thanks, Nate, for highlighting that question. There we go. All right, so now that we have our screen, the first step we want to do is add our header bar. 
Now, how you do this at make.powerapps.com might be a little different than how you do this in Teams. Uh, one of the best practices we don't have time for today is we could create a reusable component. And this reusable component can be, can we can create a perfect header for our organization and then use that over and over and over again. The way we're building it today is gonna be a one screen application, technically two screens of the one we just built. But typically though, you would have a reusable header. Uh, otherwise, you're gonna have, if you wanna make a change, you have to go to every single screen to make that change or copy and paste back into it. We're gonna be a little bit lazy right now though and just do a, a one to one ratio. So to start with, I'm gonna to go to my insert ribbon and, and click on this rectangle right here. So again, it's on, on my insert and then rectangle. I'm going to uh, move that all the way over to create a nice header menu. Perfect, looks pretty good. And I'll notice there are themes, yes, but I wanna have my own theme here. I want to create a, an experience where my users can't, or I can control the theme because that teal color is not necessarily my company colors. So I want to do this myself in this case. So in your uh, the document I sent you, and you don't have to do this, guys and gals, uh, but I'm going to create a set of three variables. This is the first bit of coding you're going to learn today. We're going to use a command called, oh, my mouse is back. I'm not sure what happened. It came back all of a sudden. I can stop zooming in like crazy. Sorry about that, guys. All right. So what we're going to do here is we're going to create three variables, one for our primary color, one for an accent color, and then one for a background color. So to do that, I'm going to go click on this word app in the top left. Once you click on that word app, look up top and look for the property called start uh, uh, called on start. Now, this is the way of doing it today. They are going to make a better way of doing this in the future. Uh, future is already a preview feature, but uh, we'll come back. It's called named formulas. But for the time being, let's do it this way. Okay, because it's still preview uh, as of right now. All right, I'm going to paste in this code that I put into the Word doc. Uh, again, that Word doc can be found right here. Uh, but make sure, again, it is case sensitive. And you do not have to do this to be successful. I'm just making this a little, little bonus tip we can do here today. All right, so what does this code do? Well, it's going to create three variables. The set command creates a variable, a global variable that can be seen on any number of screens. Uh, the variable is called var primary in my case. I always prefix all my variables with var so I know it's a variable. And then I have two ways of doing colors. One is the RGBA command. The RGBA command allows us to use a, a red, green, blue, and, and so on there. Or I can use a hex code using color value. As I click on the word RGBA, we can see the color that's going to be imp implemented here as part of my header color and my accent color and my background color. So this kind of lets you see what you're building as you do it. These two forward slashes are just comments. And the semicolon you see after that is a the next command and the next command and the next command and so on and so on. All right. So if I want to use this now, that color that is created, I can select that rectangle that I added earlier. And you'll notice that right now it has the word on select in the property drop down box. Instead of on select, let's select the fill color instead. And that fill color right now is that kind of tealish blue color, or gray color right there. Instead, I'm gonna type in var primary. And I'm intentionally making a bug right now. So I put in var primary. Well, as we can see right now, it's black. So it's not necessarily working. We should see that bright blue color when we do this. Well, I did this intentionally to kind of illustrate here that this app, we put this code on on start, and that code only fires off when the app starts. Or we can initiate that and, and kick it off manually by selecting this little dot 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 next to on start uh, next to app, and select on start. 
So by doing it, by selecting app, hit the dot, 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 and then on start, it is going to run this app, and there we go. Now we get our blue color now. There are other, other properties you'd want to set, like the hover fill and those kind of things. For that, just to kind of show you briefly that on this, I hit the drop down box, look for my hover fill property, and notice it's set to a different color. What I would typically recommend is just say, hey, just use whatever the color is of the rectangle. So if I type in self dot, it's gonna look at the rectangle and take its property called fill color. So whatever the fill property is, it's gonna set it to the hover fill property also. So now when I hover over it, nothing happens. That's what I wanna see. Okay, again, every so often, save it by hitting the button up top or hitting control S to make sure it's all saved. So, so far, so good. We're rocking and rolling now. Now I'm gonna go ahead and select my screen. And then for my screen, I'm gonna change its fill color to var background. All right, now we're coming along. We got kind of a bluey gray color for our background. And I typically, when you're building applications, you are you're not gonna wanna use that, that that cut uh, background images ideally use really light colors and then have stark differences on the front of it like a white background for a form or a white background for a or a dark background whatever do some kind of major difference that guides the user's eyes where you want them to go and that's what we're going to do today so our goal now is we're going to build a way of of showing the users their form of data and we're going to also show the users um, their the gallery of all the contracts that are ready for approval also so that's our next our next piece here but to start with though okay um okay so question here from dlp okay i don't see the tree view icon at all how can i see the tree view icon so uh, what you can do if you're not seeing that, and I can't see your screen right now, unfortunately, DLP, but you can hit that little icon up top and it should hopefully show you the names of it. If you don't see the tree view, I, I can't imagine, that's gotta be a bug. So at that point, I can't imagine that being anything you've done in this case or no permission problem. So it's gotta be a bug of some sort or, or whatnot. But it looks like he did get it. He got, oh, he found it. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, so I'll hide that. All right, so now we're ready to create our, our finish our header now. So let's go to the insert ribbon again, and let's drag a label right where that box is right there. Okay, and I'm gonna move that label, make it as, as wide as you want, make it as big. I'll go with the 26 fonter, I'll make it nice and bold on the right side. So again, I'm making it bold, I'm making it big, and I'm also going to make it, uh, I'll change the color down here to white. Those are the three things I'm going to do right now. So it kind of stands out a little bit more against that side. We can also put padding in there. You'll see padding right here if you wish. Or if you're being lazy like me, I can just bump it a little bit to the side there. Okay. I'm also going to drop in a image. So I'll search for image. There it is. And I'll drag that to the top right there also. And I want this to be my image in this case. So I want this to be the image you're seeing right here up top. I want that to come down to here also. So it feels more like that office type application. All right, that's my next goal here. So I'll select that image and in the code up top here for that image, make sure you have image selected. I'm gonna use your second piece of code today and that is the user function. You'll do a user open close parenthesis dot image. All right, notice it kind of guides you along the way here. So I can get the email address, the image, or whatever. When I do that, you see the picture matches. And if you want that rounded corner, make sure it's first of all squared. So make sure your, your width and height is roughly the same. And if it is, there's a property down here called border radius. And if you want it to be a circle like you see up top right, I could change that like 60 and then it rounds the corner beautifully there also. The only thing wrong with that image is me. All right, cool. All right, there we go. So get it somewhere like what you, want, what you want. You can also select that label and call the application whatever I want. Yeah, call it contract management system or whatever. Okay. 
So call this whatever you want and your app header is now done. Again, make sure you save every so often. But I wanna show you one of the flaws in our application now. If I were to play this application in the top right, notice how much space it's, it's not using right now. So all this space right here is not being, not being occupied in this case. So there's a ways around that, some ways we can kind of make this kind of really stretch and compress. We can use containers. We can also select our screen, for example, and go to something like the width property. And we can say app.width, for example. So what you see app.width here, it will stretch that and compress it based on that. And the same thing for our header up top. We go app.width with that. Or alternatively, if you wanna be a little lazy for the purpose of this session, and for other apps you build, you can click on the settings button up top. And when I go to the settings button up top, I'll go to display and I'm gonna hit scale to fit. And I'm also gonna, uh, I'm also gonna hit lock aspect ratios. So again, I went to settings and I checked these two items right here. Now this is not gonna use all the real estate, but what it does give me the ability to do if I hit the play button is it kind of uses most of the real estate. For me. This is, this, is, this is normally turned on by default at make.powerapps.com and you don't have to worry about it. But in Teams, you do have to worry about it because your teams are gonna, are gonna eat up a lot of real estate. And this will then compress based on the amount of real estate you're eating up. All right, again, so make sure you save. And we're now ready to go out there and create our table to our next piece. Now there's two options we have to create tables. We could go to our database icon on the left side and create the table from there. That's option A. Option B, which I'm gonna show you now. So do this with me, make sure you're saved though, guys, before you do this. So save your app in the top right. And then I'm gonna hit the build button up top. This build button up top is going to let us have access to our solution, to everything that's in the solution. And when you click on build, this is how you're typically going to enter this now that you've actually hit start now before. This is how you're going to come in every subsequent time. You're going to come in. It's going to look like this. Don't, you don't, don't do this. You'll see a list of all the pre-made applications you have and the last recent apps that you built and all that. So next time you come in, this Power Apps button, this is what it's going to look like. I'm going to hit the Build button, which is what you just clicked on. I'll choose my team. In this case, this is the, my, my the, uh, the team that I did right here. There we go. There it goes. Then I'm going to hit See All underneath that white box. By doing See All, it's going to take me into my environment. And it's going to show me all the objects in this environment, in this, in this team, in this case. That previous area you saw a moment ago is also where you can load data from SharePoint, from SQL Server, from wherever into these tables if you wanted to as well. So if you already have a list of vendors that you want to use, there is something called data flows that will allow you to load data into these tables uh, from wherever your data source of choice might be. So if you already have SharePoint, you can use this to bring it in. All right, so you can see that I have one app and one table, okay? There's a name of my table right here that I will see in Power BI, for example, or also in areas like Power Automate. That's the logical, the, the, the logical name that you'll see there. All right, I'm going to create, though, a new table. So again, I'm in the Build button, just kind of real, real quick recap this. I went to Build. Make sure I'm in the right team on the left side. There's my data flows right there. We're not going to cover those right now. And I'll hit see all. Then I hit new and table. And now we're going to create our second table. This is more the, the way you might be used to if you're already using Dataverse today. This is a solution. And this solution, you'll notice I can get to that solution at any point at make.powerapps by opening it in Power Apps right there. I'm not going to do that. But that's how I can do that. I'm going to call this table contract. You know, this is in that Word doc that I sent you guys. For the primary column, I'll click on that. And I don't want the contract name. I'm going to use contract number. So the primary column that you're seeing here is how you and I are going to communicate 
about a given record. By going with contract number instead of contract name, this gives you the ability to, uh, to say, I'm gonna have an auto number basically. Hey, I'm calling about contract one, two, three, for example. So this contract number is an auto number eventually. We have not set it up that way yet. And will allow you to communicate, allow the customer or the vendor to communicate about certain things. So why would I do an auto number versus a name? So because in this case, my contract numbers, my, con my contracts don't really have any kind of way that a customer would call me about something. So this number is going to be this. It is not guaranteed to be unique. And it is also not your primary key if you have, if you're a database person. It is simply a way of better communication. If I go back to properties, you can see that I can also uh, turn on things like auditing under advanced ribbon here. And you get other stuff like creating new activities and all that, but we're gonna leave this stuff alone and we'll hit the save button. Our second table is now created. It takes about 30 seconds to create that. And it's gonna route me into the solutions little dataverse area designer here. Okay. So you'll see now that I'm in my contract table on the left side. And my primary column is contract number. And I'm seeing that right here. So again, I have not made that an auto number, but I wanna go through and make that an auto number and add my other columns to that. Well, on the, on the right side, you'll see there's my columns. And this is where we're starting to see the limitations of Dataverse. I don't have forms, for example. I don't have business rules. I do have views and I do have relationships and those kind of things. So it's a little bit pared down in this case. But if I click on columns, either right here or on the left side by going to contracts and columns, either way, you can also get there this way. So one of those three ways, either here, here, or in that overview tab. So go to your columns and you're gonna see all the plumbing of Dataverse. These are all the columns that Microsoft has created for you. Now, one tip we can do, there's a lot of columns that are part of the plumbing, like who created the record? When was it last modified? All that stuff is all part of the plumbing of Dataverse. The other piece of the plumbing, if I go back to tables here, is you'll notice that if I go back to my contract table, there is a, don't, don't do this guys, but there's a manage permission button right here. And if I click on that, I can, in one click, make it where a, a person can only see their own records. So you can read your own records, update your own records, and create any new records by default. So that's a, a really quick way of securing this table if you want. Again, I'm not gonna do that right now, but just give you a quick heads up. That will automatically filter the data for your users. But it only will filter it, notice back here again, it's only gonna filter it if they're a member of a team and not an owner of a team. Owners have full access to all the data, but members only have partial access if you so chose. Okay, so on the left side here, all right, so on the left side here, I'm gonna go back to my columns. That's where I was before. And you'll notice there's a lot of columns here. My goodness, a lot of columns, a lot of plumbing here. And I technically only want to see my stuff here. So one way you can kind of filter this down is I can hit the name drop down box here and filter it to only show the ones that begin with CR80, for example, in my case. In my case, it's CR80. In your case, it will be something completely different. So I'm going to select this, filter it, and just do a CR, for example. Uh, CR80 is a creative buy also. When I hit apply, I'm only getting the two columns that I care about. These two columns are my primary, oops, are my primary name column. This is the one that I created. And this column right here is my primary key for the table. You can see it's a unique identifier. And this is what makes each row guaranteed to be unique, okay? So to make contract number an auto number, I can select this uh, contract number. Then I can change it here where it says data type from a single line of text to an auto number. And now we can see here that I have uh, a number starting at 1000 and working its way up. 
We can also, by the way, put some type of prefix on this to make it easier for my users to find their data. I typically would put a prefix like a C for contracts. And why would I do that? Well, imagine your company, your call center, for example, has businesses calling in and individuals calling in. Well, in this example, if you have both calling in, if I call about, hey, I'm calling about B1000, your call center will know it's a business application versus an individual application. So that's the reason why I typically will prefix these columns is because I want the, the user, when, it, when, it, when a call comes in, to automatically know where to go, okay? So uh, a question here from TD, can, and can members of the team access the Dataverse tables directly in Teams? Well, they are allowed in this case to, if they, if they have access, they can see their own records potentially. And depending on how you configure it, yes, they could do that if you configure it in such a way. Uh, you can also prohibit them from doing that as well, potentially. Okay. All right. So I'll hit the save button here. So now that's now an auto number column automatically. Okay. And there is a, I'm going to create a new column now up top. Again, I'm in the column section. I'm going to hit new column. And I'll create my next column as contract description. Again, all of these columns are in the Word doc that I provided you earlier. This is a recap, that Word doc right there for you in case you're curious. Again, pause me if you want to go and find it. Make sure you, it is case sensitive. So go out there and find it that way if you want. This will save you a little time of, ha of having to go and find out what columns I was referring to. All right. So single live text. No, I think I want multi-line in this case. So if I hit the drop down box, I can go to text and multi line of text. Now, rich, rich text you see right here is going to save the data in HTML format, allow you to bold and highlight certain things and change the font color. To me, I just want the, the raw text. So make it plain text for the purpose of this example. But if you want some fancier stuff, then that will work. You can change it to rich text if you wanted to also. Okay. I'm going to save that. Contract description is now done. Our next column, we're going to create about five columns in total here. So our next column, whoa, there we go. Our next column is going to be called uh, sponsor. And this is the sponsor who actually is, is, is creating this contract. What, what individual has signed up for this contract? So this is going to be a single line of text. It'll be the person's email address. So for format this time, I'm going to change that format to an email. So that way it makes things a little bit easier to do. Okay, so I'll save that record. All right, my next column. All right, this one will be called contract value. And this will be a currency field this time. Okay, a few things to note. As you do this, you'll see the actual schema name and the logical name inside of here. Not logical name, but schema name in here. You can set the mins and the maxes and those kind of things in here as well. But again, so contract value and currency. Everything is optional for our example today. So we'll save. All right, our next column is the overall value. How do you, how do you rate this contract uh, as far as the impact of the company, perhaps? So this one is going to be a whole number. So look for number. There it is, and whole number. Okay, so overall value is a number and whole number. And you can also change the format if you wanted to later, but we'll, we'll keep that as is for the time being. Almost done, folks. We'll hit new column again. We'll call this one approval status. This is where we're going to bring in Power Automate, hopefully, later to do this. Approval status is going to be a drop down box, a list of choices of approved, rejected, draft, and so on. So I'll make this one a choice and choice again. So choice and choice. Now, there's a whole slew, when I do sync this choice with, it's a whole slew of choices that Microsoft has provided us. In our case, though, we're going to create a new choice uh, that will be controlled by us. We can use this choice for any application inside of this Dataverse uh, environment here, or in this case, a team environment. So I'll hit new choice, and I'm going to call this approval status, and always put the word choice when you do this. It's going to help you find it easier later. 
and it's going to make our Canvas application easier later also. So my first choice is we draft. All right, I'll call this uh, in review. All right, next one is going to be called uh, approved and rejected. All right, these values you see right here make this choice unique on the left side. Once you're ready, save it. And when I say it's easier to find, what I mean now is when I go to sync this choice with, I can type in the word choice and there's my approval status right there. We can also color code these choices later if you wanted to as well. And you can always come back and edit those later. Then change this, this uh, um, default choice to draft or submitted or whatever you want to do it and hit save. All right. Cool. Almost done. I have two more columns to create. I'll put one here called approval comments. So my director has reviewed this and what comments have they put? I'll make that one a multi-liner also. Okay. And save that. And then my final column is what vendor is this proposal, this, this contract for? So last column is a vendor. And the data type this time is going to be a lookup right there. And a lookup allows you to join two tables together. In my case, the table I'm going to join is the vendor table. So you can type it. But in this case, what I changed, I called it vendor, made it lookup, and my related table was vendor. All right. Hit the Save button, and your table is now complete, and you now have relationships between these two tables. So we're ready to go back to our application. And then after, after our little break, we're also going to go and, and build a power automation as well. So hopefully at this point now, you have your table now done. Again, all those columns are in that Word doc for you. Now that we've done this, though, we're ready to go back to the Word apps here, and we're going to see the app that we created earlier. There's my app right there. If I click on that, we're going to go back to our editor to now edit this application. All right, give it a few seconds to open up. It might take some time, as you mentioned before, uh, and it can be slow now. Notice it starts off on screen one. And of course, in a real app, we would rename these objects as well to things that are more appropriate, like SCR welcome and SCR contracts or vendors or whatever. All right, so what this app is going to have, it's gonna be a two zone application. On the left side here, we're gonna have a gallery and this gallery is gonna show all contracts. All right, on the right side, we're gonna have a form right here where we're going to enter new contracts. So this will be a list of uh, for contract entry here. So this is what the app is going to look like ultimately. That gallery is one way we can show data, but there are other ways as well. But I think it's, it's usually the best way of, of doing it here. So let's start with our form first. Since we have no data here, let's start by adding our form. So in the, uh, the insert ribbon up top, you'll see an edit form. Go ahead and click on that edit form once you're ready. And again, just a word of warning, save frequently because somebody, some joker at your company is going to send you a text message or IM and you're gonna leave and you're like, ah. So make sure you save very, very frequently here. Again, just get in the habit of hitting control S every so often. All right, so for this form, the reason why we have that background color is now on the form, I can change my color on the right side to white, and it kind of stands out now, doesn't it? It guides your eyes where you want them to go. Next, for your data source up here on the top right, change that data source, go to tables, and there's my contract table. If you can't find it, search for it up top. And when you click on contracts, there we go. It's going to try to add the columns that it thinks that we want. All right, there we go. Oh, it, it, it's my mouse disappeared again. All right. So it's going to try to add the contracts that it thinks we want now at this point. So you'll see things like approval status and all these kind of columns here. However, we want to also see uh, the vendor. Notice vendor is not here. So the columns it does not add are the, the columns like that are lookup columns. So to do that, I'm going to go to the right side, select my entire form. So make sure the entire form is selected. 
and then go to edit fields. When I do that, I'm going to add a new field and I'll call this one, uh, was it vendor, right? There it is. There's my vendor column right there. So let me, let me do that one more time here. So again, I'm going to select my entire form and I need to add that lookup column that we created earlier. So I'm going to hit edit fields, hit add field and find my vendor column somewhere right there. Go ahead and select it and then hit the add button. The contract number, on the other hand, well, that's a really a read-only column. So I could select that and remove the contract number because I don't want people to feel like they, they should be adding data in that column. You can also go through, though, and move these fields however you wish. So if you want vendor up top, drag and drop it. Make this your own application. This contract value, notice it recognizes it's a, it's a, uh, uh, a currency field. The overall value column though, I'm gonna change this from edit number to edit rating. Now, the number one mistake I see people make is they do view rating. Make sure you do edit rating. The reason why I'm doing that is you may not know, hey, is overall value is a number from one to five. How would you know that? What if you, what's to stop you from putting 12 there or, or two there? So by putting edit rating for overall value, it's now going to give me a number between one and five that I can use. See the little stars right here? I can make it 10 stars or three stars or whatever I wish, but right now five is fine. The last one you may, you may want to do is the, um, let's see here, approval status. I'm gonna remove approval status because I don't want them to approve their own record. Um, you, whether you wanna keep the comments or not, it's up to you. But for contract description, you see it's a multi-line text and you can make it more than one line on the, on the right side. All right, this looks pretty good, I think. This is also right now, it's set as, as three columns on the right side. You can make it two or one and you know however you want to make it. I'll go with one for the time being and let it kind of stretch out vertically here. But you do what works for you. This is your application. All right. So now, as I do this, um, there's last thing that I might want to do here. Let's see, I've got the vendor in here. I've got the approval comments. This looks pretty good. But for the sponsor column right here, I want to put your email address into that box, the, the email box, the email address of whoever signed in. To do this, I can right click and I can unlock this right here. So let's go ahead and unlock this so I can actually override what Microsoft wants me to do here. So right click on the text box for sponsor and click unlock. Once I do that, uh, we can see that there is a value option right up top. See a value right here? So let's put your email address into that box. I'll type in user open close parenthesis and notice when I do dot here, it lets me see all the columns that I have access to. If I hit tab, once I have the right one selected or click on it, it puts my email address into that box. All right, there you go, guys. You now know my email address. I'm gonna select the entire card. This is a box around the box. And I don't want you to be the sponsor for somebody else's project here. So I'm gonna select the entire box and I'm gonna look for the display property, display mode property. Two ways you can get there. One is to hit the property, the top, top left drop down box, the property drop down box. Alternatively, if you want, you can select that entire card, that box around that, those boxes, and click on the word display mode. And when you do that, it actually opens up that property in the top left. So, whatever you wish to do, it will take you there. Now, you have an option here. I'm going to type in display mode. And right now that column is editable. So it's, in, it's right now it's display mode.edit. So try two things here, try disabled. Do you like that? It's grayed out. Or if you don't like that, try display mode.view. Now it's just a, a, a view box and I could change that color to white and it would look like it's just text in there. So do whatever works for you, whatever you like. But again, the requirements that I have is where, where people cannot go through and and specify can actually specify the pro, the um, the issue here. Ricardo is back. I had Ricardo yesterday in our app in a day. Welcome, Ricardo. 
uh, thanks for coming. All right, so now that we've got that now done, make sure you hit Control S to save that, that app again. All right, so your form is now ready. We got lots more we can do in here, of course, but what we wanna do now is we wanna make it where you can submit data uh, into the database. So let's go up to the top insert ribbon up top here. Let's go to insert and let's drop our button in here now as well. This button is going to make it where, once it comes open, did I, did I, did I do it? Oh, I, <laughs> now I made a mistake here. The mistake I made is I had the card selected when I did that insert button. So I'm gonna delete my button because it actually put it inside the card. So make sure nothing is selected before you do that. I'm kind of glad I made that mistake so I can show you that. I'll go to insert again and hit button again with nothing selected and it will drop the button wherever. And I'm gonna move that kind of free floating wherever I want, okay? Of course, you can color that button using those variables if you wish. So you'll see a fill color property and you can, you can adjust that how you want. All right, so on the top right, call this button, whatever you want. So I'll call this button like save or submit or whatever. You're also noticing here there's button types here. These button types are gonna be used for accessibility features. So if, if, if people are vision impaired, this is going to help them with these buttons. You also can go through and uh, set the, the tab order for somebody who's vision impaired also. And there's lots of other options we have. And we have a whole video on that. Now, I find this font, I'm not vision impaired, but I do have some glasses next to me. And these, uh, these is a little bit, a little tiny for me. So I like to bold my fonts and make it more like a 12er or a 14er or whatever, because I have a hard time seeing that 10 font myself but that's up to your eyes and your population, okay? So on that save button, we're now ready to send that data to the database. So that's our next step. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do two things now. We're gonna send the data to the database. We're then gonna tell them in a different area that they did a great job, it's been submitted, and it's ready for review now. We're additionally going to reset this form back uh, so it's ready for the next record also. A few things, a few of you folks may have already hit the play button and noticed that you had a bug issue right now where it said no item to display. This is the most common issue you'll see in Power Apps where you're like, what the heck's going on? Well, this is where, this is the most common issue. If I hit escape, it gets out of that. But this, that's because this form can be in multiple modes. It can be in new mode, ready for new data, or in edit mode, ready to edit existing data. When I hit that play button, it's saying, hey, what record do you want to edit? So it thinks that I want to edit the record. So if I select the entire form and go to the right side, see its default mode right now is edit, meaning that it thinks I want to edit the record. So if I change that instead to new and then hit the play button, you're now going to see that I actually have my form ready to go. Okay, so a few little gotchas like that you can do like that, that, that you're going to actually hit over and over and over again. Okay, so make sure you save again. I just good practice. Just get to have it every few minutes of control Sing that. All right, so now we have our form now created. Now we need to wire that save button. There's again, I mentioned there's two things. We're gonna send the data to the database, then if it was successfully sent to the database, then we're going to alert them that all is well, and then we're gonna reset that form back to new mode. If we don't reset that form back to new mode, it's gonna reset itself back to edit mode, even though we just told it to stay in new mode. So just a word of warning, those are our three steps that we're going to do. Let's start by selecting that, that uh, save button right here, and then looking at our code, for on select. So select your button, then go to the on select property of that button. There it is. Right now it says false. Now false basically means when I click on that button, nothing's gonna happen. That's a problem, right? So let's fix that nothing's gonna happen. To submit the data to the database, the code we're gonna use is simply two words, submit form, tab, Find your form. Our form is called Form 1. This edit form was used previously on the other screen. So Form 1 is the one we're going to use. 
and then close your parentheses. Awesome. First step is now done. Now the record has been written to the database. Next, we want to find out that if it's if that form has successfully done something. So if I were to select my form here, and I want to look at the um, the property called on success. There it is. This is also an on failure. So if, if the row does not make it there, it will fail. So if it successfully makes it there, what do we want to do? Well, in my case, we're going to run some code here to hopefully send it, send, you know, send that record, uh, or, or notify the user, and then reset our form. We could also use this code to seek approval on this record also. Now, alternatively, if, if a user is in certain groups, we can also go through and say, hey, you're in this group. I'm going to show you the approve button. Otherwise, I'm going to hide that approve button. So we can get really fancy with this if you wanted to as well. But in our case, what we want to do is we want to notify the user that what they did was successful. So I'll type in notify. And then I'll say, bravo, contract uh, successfully saved. Call. We'll do whatever you want. We can also smush other stuff in there. Like you can smush in things like their full name if you wanted to. Again, you do not have to do that. But by closing the parentheses, you find a little space there. Again, you don't have to do this. You could have say successfully saved, just like I did there, and then you're done. However, right now it's going to be a gray box up top. I want to let them know that this is success successful. So I'll do a comma, and let's say this was successful. Again, I'm just using my arrows and using my tabs to say it was successful. Next, I'll do a comma again and say, how long do I want to show that banner for? Well, I want to show that banner for two and a half seconds or 2,500 milliseconds. So that's how we can do that next piece here as well. So now when I submit the data, it's going to show a little banner up top saying, bravo, success. And my next step is I'll hit a semicolon to say, do this and then do this. What is that next thing I want to do? Well, I want to reset that form not to edit mode, but back to new mode to get ready for a new contract. So I will say new form. There it is. You can use those tabs. Down arrow to form one. Tab, close your parentheses. So here's my final code. I'm going to notify the user that what they did was successful. And then I'm going to uh, reset this form right here. And it's kind of highlighted right now. Back to new mode. Perfect. So that looks like a, like a winner, winner, chicken dinner. So now that we've done that, we are now ready to test drive this a little bit and see, is this going to work? All right. So let's hit the play button up in the top right. You're seeing right up here again. And make sure, again, make sure you save just in case. <laughs> you never know. And then hit the play button to take a look at it now. All right. So I'm going to go through and, and enter my contract, uh, Nate's new uh, Gremlin car. All right. What's the vendor? Well, the vendor is a drop-down box right now, and I'm going to go to Nate's Crappy Car, Inc. All right. I'm the sponsor. The contract value you see here is actually a text box. I'll put it's going to be $25 because nobody wants those Gremlins anymore. It is overall value of one star. And there's no approval comments yet. That will be filled in automatically. And we'll hit save. All right. There is our pop-up right there up top saying it was success, successfully saved. And it goes away in two and a half seconds unless I move my mouse over it. Awesome. We can now hit the escape key to get out of that. And we're seeing we're back to our form now. In case you're curious to know, did this work or not? I mean, it says it worked, but did it really work? We can go to our database icon on the left here. So that database icon you're seeing right there, we can right click on contracts and say edit data and see there's our contract. We can even go through and say, hey, show me some more columns and check any of the comments that we want to see, like uh, show me the contract description or, or whatever the comments that you want here. You can just go through and check those. And when you hit save, you'll see all that data right there. Okay, so in case you're curious, that's how you can always go in and, and test drive that. All right, so we have our form now complete. Our, our uh, next step is going to be to, our, to do our gallery of data. 
And then we're going to do an approval system inside of the Power Automate uh, to approve all this stuff. So for our last little trick here before our break, what I want to do is I'm going to hit this little preview button or this little uh, publish to Teams button right up top. This publish to Teams button right here is going to send this into our Teams site. So I'll hit that uh, publish to Teams. There we go. And I'll hit next. Now, the screen you're about to see here, you only have to do your first time when you're building an application. And the thing I want you to do the first time, and the first time only, is hit that plus button here. The next time you come in, you're just going to open this up. The screen will come up. You just hit save and close. But for the first time, I'm going to hit that plus button, which essentially creates a, a, a tab inside of this team, this general channel called Contract Management App. And then when I hit save and close, at this point, give it a few seconds, it is now being published to my team. Now, a few things to think about as part of this. Uh, now that it's published that to Teams, it is gonna take about 30 seconds, maybe a minute and a half. Everybody else can see this, but you, my friend, are in a uh, designer mode right now. So it might have to time out that designer mode before you can do that. So to show you really quickly here, let me find my Teams. I'm gonna drag this team down here. This is the website version of Teams. All right, there we go. Now, you don't have to do this. I, I actually recommend you don't do this. But I'm going to scroll down here. I'm looking for that uh, Learn with the Nerds. There's my contract management. And hopefully here, I'm going to keep the other screen open. Again, it does take some time. If I'm the designer of this application, which I am, it takes a little while for it to come up the first time. Where Nate, on the other hand, could actually share his screen, and he would be able to see it right now. I'm going to refresh this browser one more time and just see if it's here. Again, it, this does take some time the first time you open it up, about a minute, but there we go. I can put my new contract in. I can put my new vendor here. There we go. A new five-star uh, contract. This one's going to be $45, and I'll hit save. And my second record has now been saved. So later today, we'll come back here and we'll see the flaws and the pros of what we built. But what we're seeing now is our first application inside of our Teams channel, and we're ready to rock and roll now at this point. So let's give you an opportunity to stretch your legs, hit a bio break if you wish, and uh, get some water if you wish. We'll come back, how about 10 minutes from now? And when we come back, we're gonna go to complete our application, the one we have in this other screen. So make sure you have this screen open when you come back, ready to go. And I will put uh, 10 on the clock. There we go. I will see you folks in 10 minutes, same bat time. Thanks, guys.
and welcome back. Welcome back. We are ready to start to construct our next example. So just a quick a quick heads up. Let me get back to my, oh, there we go. So uh, real quick heads up. We do have a sale right now. If this, if this stuff is interesting to you, we have about 80 classes on demand around Power Apps. I'm a Power Apps, Power Platform, and the Azure Stack. You're going to find a flash sale below me right now. Uh, and it's a learn with the nerds to LWTN50 is a promo code. And it will be applied at the checkout when you check out for the on-demand platform. So I just want to make sure I mentioned that. Also, during break, we had a question here from Robert, I believe. And his question was around, um, here we go, was around, he's an admin lieutenant, and he set the permissions up to see it. However, he still can't see it in Teams, desktop, or the web. After you enable the policy to allow people to see uh, data uh, power apps for for uh, power auto, power apps and power automate and all those kind of things inside of the dataverse uh, in Teams, it does take about 15 to 20 minutes, Robert, after you turn that on for it to show up. I've seen it take as much as a half an hour. So you might want to turn it on and then come back and maybe pause me for a little while. And then you'll be able to do all these examples with me. But it does take a little time, and I do advise uh, to plan on a, a little bit of a wait there as you're as you're doing that. So hopefully that answered your question. Let me go ahead and hide that question. And now we are ready to get back. Let me see if I can get back. My, my mouse is still not working, unfortunately, but I can get back there other ways. I hope. There we go. Oh, there it comes. I have a mouse again. Oh, there we go. All right. So. When we left off, we had built a beautiful form that is now ready to uh, insert data. We'll later get it to also edit data, and we'll also do things like making it where we can see other types of goodies in this as well. But we're now ready to actually see the data we inserted, and that's that part of that two-zone application we were going to build before. So let's start with that two-zone application. Let me kind of go back here again. All right. So. To start with, I'm going to go to my insert ribbon, and I'm going to do a vertical gallery. So make sure you have your app open and go to insert and vertical gallery. This takes a few seconds to go in. I'm just going to click on the word contracts. There we go. And I'll move this a little bit to the side, kind of get it lined up the way I want. Uh, I'm going to leave a little bit of room right on top of it for a search box in a moment. And I'm going to kind of stretch it and leave just enough room for that search box. And I will make this white background color on the right side. I'm also going to make it where, hey, I don't really care about seeing an image. So I'll go ahead and change this to just title and subtitle. There we go. Perfect. So it's not the prettiest thing in the world, but it's, uh, it's starting to get there, right? So you kind of align it, get it working the way you wish. Um, you'll find, I find these fonts are way, way too small. So you can make it, you know, a 14 fonter or whatever you wish to do. Okay. So after you get the, the way you wish, now we want to go ahead and then you put the status code or I'll make it a 12 fonter. There we go. I can kind of show up a little better there. So we can see that the, as we enter data, it immediately shows up in this left gallery. So for example, if I play this and I call this, you know, record three, for example, for Brian's luxury cars, it is a five-star rating here. And then I will hit save. You'll notice the record shows up almost instantaneously on the left side. So I want to show a few things more on this left side. I want to see the status of the record. I also want to see a search box where you can search for those records, provide you the ability to delete a record, and provide you the ability to do other stuff, like maybe edit the record also. So those are our final steps we're going to do for this application. It will take us about an hour to do all these steps. And then we're going to go and do Empower Automate as well to approve these records, to automate the approval to where you don't have to send out emails anymore for that. So I'm going to start with a search box first. And we're going to make this prettier and prettier as time goes on. So for this search box, I'm going to go to Insert up top and look for my text box. So drag that text box or, or drag it wherever you wish. I'm going to move mine right above my gallery here. Again, you're going to notice, look how small that font is. So you can always, always, if, you're, if you have uh, issues like I, can, I do, you can always make it a 12 fonter or a 14 fonter or whatever you wish to do. All right. You can also bold it if you want to add extra little spice to it as well. 
Now, a few things, a few rules of thumb here. This is going to be our search box. First of all, this is very different than what you may be used to at make.powerapps.com. So for example, there's a thing called placeholder text. At make.powerapps.com, it's called hint text. And the property is called two different things also. So for that placeholder, let's call that on the right side of selecting that text box, we'll say search for contract, something like that. But you'll notice you're not seeing it yet. So to make sure you can see it, let's strike the text box value there and click away from it. Oh, I didn't strike enough there, it looks like. There we go. And you want to make sure that you leave the double ticks behind. So again, I, I left, I, I killed everything in there. There's my search for contract. But when you select it, the value should have two double quotes right there with nothing else there. Okay, so just a just a quick heads up. If you have any value at all there, keep in mind it is going to search for that and lose that value. But you can go through and you know make it bold, make it italicize, whatever you want to do uh, to make it your own. Okay. Now I want to search based on the contract number and maybe the description of this down below. So to do this, we're going to use a search syntax to do it. So select that gallery right there. And before you, I forgot one piece. I'm going to select my text box here and just find its name either on the right side here or in the tree view here. Okay. All right. So for those that are watching this, when uh, I, I see a question from uh, WJC Stella, when I hit that play button, it says no item to display. Why do you guys think that is in the chat window? Help out w, WJC Stella. That was one of our points of emphasis that you will have that problem. Nate and I have been doing this for many, many years now, and we still have that problem. We're like, ah, I forgot to do that. So why do you think he's seeing that option? Let's, let's help help a, help a fellow friend out here in the chat window. You'll see in the chat window there. I'm going to let you, I'm going to select this, this form here. And on the right side, you should see that default mode there, WJC. Change that, that default mode to new, not edit when you select the form. But hopefully somebody's already answered that question by the time you see this. I'm about 30 seconds behind you now, or in front of you now at this point. All right, so for search. Let's go ahead and select our gallery, and we'll see it's showing all contracts right now. In front of contracts, we can see that there are my three records right there that it's showing. There they are. Okay. So I'm going to type in the word search in front of contracts. Now, unlike SharePoint, SharePoint, if I was pointing to a SharePoint list, the search syntax will work, but it's something called a delegatable event. In other words, it basically can't interpret this syntax. And it says, SharePoint, give me everything. And then all from there, I'm gonna go through and find a way to make, to make this work. By doing that, it limits you to, to just a few hundred rows by default and up to 2000 rows at a maximum in SharePoint. So searching SharePoint, this, this is not the syntax that will work in SharePoint necessarily. You have to use filter syntax to do it in SharePoint and you have to kind of do what it begins with and it ends with to kind of make it work. So what I'm going to do, though, is type search contracts, do a comma, and notice right above this, it's kind of guiding me every step along the way. So right next to this, I'll type in text input, uh, text box one, there it is, all right, dot text. So go ahead, oh, not text. See, I'm used to make.powerapps is dot text. And, and, uh, and, and here, with the modern controls, it's dot value instead. So it's a little different, and it's just enough to mess with you sometimes as you're building this stuff out. So, so take whatever value is in that text box, apply it to the contract table, and then when you do a comma, it wants to know what, what commas do you want, what, what comma columns do you want to search? Well, I want to search the contract description, comma. Uh, how about the number of the contract, maybe the contract number? And that's good enough attempt for now. I'll close that parenthesis out. When I do that now, you're seeing the same area because I have not really done any kind of filters in my, I haven't done any kind of anything in that search box yet. Let's play our application and try this out. So I'll play it. I'll type in, how about 1002? Oh, there it is. 
I'll type in, how about uh, Nate? There's Nate. I'll type in uh, here, and there's here, and so on, and so on, and so on. So it allows you to search, basically a contain search for anything, anything inside that value that you want. So it automatically takes care of that contain search, but it also goes through and searches multiple columns. So the search syntax is great for searching first name, last name, email address, and so on, and so on, and so on, all with one command. Now, you may have noticed I had those, those logical names there that you saw. So the logical names meaning that I had, uh, let me go back there again. I had that CRADC name in my case. So yours will be called something different. Uh, the search syntax, for some reason, it, it wants those logical names inside of this interface only. It's only a Teams thing at this time right now, it looks like. All right, so first step is now done. We have our search piece now done. Now, we also might want to go and say, hey, I only want to find stuff that you were the uh, sponsor of as well. OK. All right. So, all right. WJC. Additionally, when I hit the play button, it says no item display. I have changed the form to new mode. So this is an, I'm glad you asked this question. Um, what happens in this case is when you select this form and you know it's a new mode and you play it, you might have to full it here. By fulling it, I mean you have to change it from new to edit and then back to new to, to force it to, to new mode again. What's happened there likely is in your form, this new form code right here may have been implemented out of order. So make sure that code is in here and that's gonna revert it back to new mode. If it's not there, if, it was, if, if you had played this form ahead of them, you got a little antsy and got a little excited and hit the play button, that might be what's causing the problem. If you hit the play button before you had put this code in there, it would have reverted to edit mode, even though it says new, and you have to kind of fool it by going back and forth, edit, then new, and then you're ready to rock and roll. So that happens occasionally. Uh, it's only, but when you programmatically do it, it will work every time there for you. All right, next, well, wouldn't it be great to see the value of this contract? Has it been approved or not easily inside of here? To do that, what I'm gonna do is a little trick here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna select the first record, okay? And when I select that first record, I'm going to go to insert and rectangle, and I'm gonna drag that rectangle in here. The reason I'm having you drag it in there is because the interface and the Teams interface requires you kind of drag it into that first record. Where in make.powerapps, when you select the first record, that's good enough. You just hit the insert, rectangle, it doesn't work. I'm gonna move that rectangle far left, make it a thin bar, just like that. And then I'm gonna nudge everything else a little bit over. Just kind of nudge it over just a wee bit, just like that. And then we're off to the races. So I'm gonna put inside of this where that bar is, I'm gonna put the status of that given item. Before I do that, now that we kind of laid it out, before I do that, I wanna show you a few little pieces here. If I select C1000, you'll see in your coding window, the text value for C1000 is this item.contract number. This item is referring to the row that I'm looking at. And then contract number is the column in that row. So this is basically a data repeater down here. And if you ever wanna to refer to a row, you always refer to this item. And that allows you to go to any column that you wish. So for example, I could change that and it would immediately reflect a new column if I wanted to. I'm gonna leave it as is, but just to show you what I mean, I'm gonna backspace that dot and you could say, I wanna see just this, the contract, and it will show that GUID right there, for example, okay? All right, so not a great, I would probably have a title of the contract in the real world here, uh, like some shorthand description of the contract, and that's what I would show, or I should have a sponsor's picture or whatever. But for the purpose of what we're doing now, this is adequate. All right, so when I select this rectangle here, I wanna change the fill color based on has this contract been approved or not? So let's go to our fill property. All right, there it is, the fill property for the rectangle, where I'm gonna strike this code. Now we could build a whole series of if then statements, if then else, if then else, if then else. 
But in our case, because we have what four states that we have what draft and review approved and rejected because we have those four states, I don't want to build an if statement that has four nested if statements. So the, an alternative for that is the switch sent statement. The switch, sent, the switch syntax, excuse me, uh, allows us to go through and say, hey, evaluate this item dot approval status. Take that column. And then from that column, what I can do is I can go through and say, um, if it's equal to, uh, let's start with in review, or let's start with uh, approved. If it's approved, I want to show the green color. If it's uh, rejected, I want to show the red color. So the, the word rejected is going to be in double quotes, and then red is to be outside of quotes. Otherwise, do golden, uh, golden rod. That's a, like a gold yellow color. Now you'll notice I have two. I have a, a lot of red underlines right now. The reason why I have that is this is a choice column. The word uh, the, the approved and rejected is a choice column. And there's a few ways I can solve that. I could go through, so don't do this first part, okay? I could go through and type in the word uh, approval status choice and say dot uh, approved. That's one way of doing it. And then say comma green and so on. I took the change of rejected to make that work, okay? Or let me just put the word approved back in there. Or if I'm feeling especially lazy right now, right after the right before the, this item, I can type in the word text, open parenthesis, and then close it right there. So that is two ways of accomplishing the same thing. By putting the word text in there, what it basically is saying is take the text value, the textual value of that approval status column, and put the word if it's a word approved, then put green. Let me zoom in a little closer so you guys can see that. So take the text value out of that. And if it says a word approved, then make it green. If it says a word rejected, then make it red. And I can string these together over and over and over again. If any other value is in there, make it yellow. Okay, so it's the, that handles the in review and, and also the draft. But if we wanted to add more, all we have to simply do is go in here and say, uh, what, do we, what do we call it? We called it uh, in review, and we can make that blue, for example. So just like that. So you can keep on chaining them together that easily there. Okay, so let's test this to see if it worked. What I'm gonna do, you don't have to do this, just kind of watch if you like. I'm gonna go to my database icon. I'm gonna right click on contracts and I'm gonna edit the data and see is, if I, if I change this, let me go ahead and show more and I'm gonna get the status column. There we go. And I'm gonna change one of these from that to in review and I'll change another one from draft to approved. And then I'm gonna hit close to save all those two values. And in a few seconds, gonna refresh my data. And now I have one, that's golden rod, one blue and one green. So this gives me an easy way to kind of see how does my data look right now, okay? So I kind of like that. Uh, and of course you would still do the hover fill, change the hover fill to be self.fill and the same thing we did for the, hover, the, the button up top here, okay? But it, what I like about it, especially, and thank you very much, David, uh, I like it because it, it's minimal real estate, but it, it communicates a lot in a very little, min, very minimal amount of real estate. I could put the word right here, um, I could put the word status and say, was it been approved or rejected? But this makes it a lot easier to kind of find out what's going on. Okay, so mission accomplished on that one. Now, we want to provide the way uh, of deleting a record. And we also want to provide a way of editing the record next as well. And then hit Control S to save that. And if I go in here again, I'm going to insert, I'm going to select the first record, and I'm going to insert in there a icon. How about we go ahead and I'm going to just insert any icon. Let's search for any icon and drag that icon into here. The reason why I had you delete, select any icon is now you can go up top with this icon and you can search for the one that you want to do for editing. So you could do a pin, you could do a, a pin, you could do a, you know, um, a, a pencil like this guy here, whatever works for you. This is a, an interesting pencil, but it works fine. So when you click on this pencil, 
I want this to be able to edit the record over here. So let's start here. There's two lines of code we're going to have to do to, to enable our edits. The first line of code we're going to do is when you select this pencil, where it says on select, I'm going to change where it says select parent. Select parent means that if you click on the pencil, it clicks on uh, the parent, the, the whole cell. Uh, it, basically, it does a click for you. I don't really need that to happen in my case. What I want to happen is I want to change this form on the right side to edit mode. So I'll just type in edit form, perfect, and then form one, done. That's our first line of code. So our coding is halfway done. Now let's play, the, don't, don't do this, I'm gonna play this and just show you the flaw here. I hit the pencil icon, no item to display. So the form is definitely in edit mode now, but it has no idea what row to edit. So now I have to specify what row to edit next. So if I select this, um, this, this guy right here, this whole form on the right side, I'm going to change this. I'm looking for the item property. The item property is only used if the form is in edit mode. And it tells it what row do you want to edit. Well, this left area is called gallery one. Keep a mental note on that left area right here. I'll select my form. And for this item, I'll type in uh, for the item property. Again, I said the whole form, item property, it's gallery one dot selected. Boom. So now when I hit the play button, look at this, Nate's new Gremlin car, I hit the pencil, boom, boom, boom. And I can change this from record three to Brian's new, new Ferrari. Amazing car. There we go. And I'll hit save and it immediately gets written back to the database. So two lines of code to basically uh, go through with that and implement that. Okay. All right, so now that we've got that, let me go ahead and close that out. Save it if you wish. Now, a common question we get asked is, I, all, I don't want you to be able to edit this record if it's been approved, for example. So you might go back and forth during the review stage, but during the final stage, no touchy, okay? So what we can do is, for this, um, uh, for this pencil icon, if you wanted to, I'm gonna change its visibility right here. And right now it's at the true. So what I wanna say here is if, if, it's, uh, if it's in draft status right now, it's not been picked up for review yet, then I'm gonna go ahead and, and allow this to be edited. So all I have to do is say um, this item, there we go, approval status, dot approval status, is equal to, and we could do the whole text thing again like we did before, or if we wanted to just type in the word choice and select that approval status choice. So if it's equal to um, a, a draft, there it is. So if this, if this status column is equal to draft, then allow them to do it. So notice I didn't put an if statement here. I could have been explicit and I could have done an if statement, if that is equal to draft, comma, then true. Uh, oh, not, not uppercase, there we go, comma true, and then comma false. So we could get very explicit. It says the same thing, but if for a simple Boolean answer like that, that's how you can do it. We can also say if it's equal to draft, or uh, I can just go ahead and copy and paste this one more time. Be lazy. Again, you don't have to do this, guys. I just want to show you the first way. is probably the way I normally go with. Uh, or if it's equal to in review, I think it's called, right? There we go. So I got two pencils now. That double pipe there is an or syntax. So you can basically use that to kind of knock that out also. Okay. So now we can edit two records, but not the approved record here also. Awesome. So you'll notice that as you do this, that the sponsor will always remain the same. So we could also put some code there that says, if I'm in edit mode, show the original value. But if I'm in new mode, use your email address. So we can put some logic like that. If we have time extra at the end of this session, then I'll, I'll, I'll show you how to do that also. All right, so as I select this, and kind of select this, everything looks to be working. 
I can't edit this record. It's, it's basically, we can make it where it's view only also. We could say, hey, if you if you uh, show a an eyeglass icon, if it's, an, if it's already been approved, so you can see it, but you can't actually edit it. So there's lots of options you have here to make this a lot better application. But our next step is, I wanna be able to delete a record also. So again, select your first record, drop an icon in, so to search for icon, you can also, if you want to search for trash, if you want, so pick whatever icon you wish and drag in the first record. If you did not get the icon you wish, go to icon and find whatever makes sense for you to delete a record. Okay, select your trash icon, and this is super, super easy. For the code on this, on select, we'll change this to remove, perfect. What record do you want to, where do you want to remove it from? I'm going to remove it from the contracts table, comma. I have typed in an R so far. Everything else has been done with tabs. So remove it against the contracts table. And what item do you want to remove? This item. This item is the entire row I want to remove from this record. So now, as I hold the Alt key down and I hit and I click on this uh, trash can for the approved record, there it goes, and hasta luego, it is now gone. So really easy kind of control we have of this. All right, so pretty darn snazzy though, right? So with that now done, we now are ready to kind of get a few more little, little bows on this now at this point. So we have our delete working, we have our edit working, we have our search working. So all of that is now kind of coming together. Now I mentioned before, let's, let's, let me show you the problem here. If I right click on this and go to edit data and I put Nate's email address in here, uh, let me find our sponsor here. There it is. You don't have to do this guys. Just wanna kind of show you a problem here. I'm gonna go ahead and put, there we go, uh, put some, some bogus email address in here. All right. So when I do that, I forgot which record it was, uh, it's now a refresh. And as I pick up the pencil here, it still has Brian Knight, even though I've clicked on Nate's record. So that's one of the issues I've I've uh, I've had that in, in this case. Okay. All right. So if I select this this guy right here, the sponsor right here, you'll notice right now it's showing user open close parenthesis dot email. Well, wouldn't it be great instead? to only pull that email address if it's in new mode. Otherwise, show the existing email address. So to do this, if I wanted to, and I had to do it for any kind of fields like this, where I want to that have default values in here. So in this case, what I want to do is I'm going to say for this, you know, this is optional, for this, this sponsor here, I want to say if, open parenthesis, and I want to find the form name. Mine is called form one dot mode there it is so if it's mode is equal to form mode dot uh new there we go in other words this form is in new mode trying to insert a record so if it's a new mode comma grab your email address the one that's logged in otherwise use this item dot sponsor all right so by doing this, what it's telling us now is I see Brian's email address uh, right now, because that, that's a record here, but now I see Nate's email address. And if I get out of this, now I see Brian's back in here again. So for, and when the form is in new mode, it shows me Brian's email address. When I select on the second record, now I see Nate's email address. So anywhere where you see default values like that, this code that you're seeing right here is going to solve that problem. If the form is a new mode, use my email address. Otherwise, show who, whatever the sponsor is, is, that is stored inside there. All right, so I, I might need a little clarification on this question from Jim here. The question from Jim was, we use Team Store outside of Teams extensively. Uh, can we link Dataverse tables in Teams uh, in terms of defined of non-Teams? I, 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 I need a little clarification on that, Jim, I'm sorry. Um, so, that ultimately, uh, uh, if you want to build an application, at the time of this 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 class in October of 2022, at least, uh, you can't have one dataverse be seen by another dataverse uh, easily. At least, uh, there's no like you know Power Automate to kind of copy data back and forth. 
but I think I think I need a little explanation. Uh, you can also email me if you want as well, Jim, and I can, I'll see. I'm I trying my best to kind of uh, answer deeper there as well. All right, cool. All right, Nate, do you want to come in? You think you know uh, you have have an answer there? All right. So let me go ahead and save this again. And now that we've saved it, I think at this point. We're ready to start to show some goodies here and maybe show some workflows and those types of things. So awesome. I think this is a good starting point here. Again, the play button see, is scaling, so everything looks like it's working well. I'm now ready to publish this application again. So let me just check my, check my uh, goodies that I was hoping to cover. I have covered all those. Awesome. Uh, we could also, by the way, filter this list to where you're only seeing your own data. You do not have to do this, but let me show you how I would do that. I would just put a filter syntax in front of my search and a comma at the very end of my search and say, I only want to see uh, records where I'm the sponsor of it equals my email address. That's how you would do that if you want to do that. Notice Nate's record now disappears uh, if I want to do that. Okay. You can also make it where it's conditional, where I, being the submitter, um, uh, can see only my own rate records, where you might be able to edit the records because you're the approver in this. All right, so now we're ready to go ahead and, and publish our changes. So let's hit this Publish the Teams button one more time. All right, I'll hit Next. OK, now this time, as I mentioned before our break, all I have to do is hit save and close. I'm going to go to the same exact tab I was already in and hit save and close. So I did not have to hit the plus button this time. All right, we are almost done. Our power app is now pretty darn powerful. Not too bad for an hour of work, right? Hour and a half of work or whatever. But now I want to go ahead and build our automation around that. And now, of course, we can integrate automation right here with the power automate button. But in our case, we might have multiple sources, uh, multiple people inserting data into this from multiple applications. So I'm going to go over here under the, uh, the Build button again. So I'm going to go to the Build button right there, which is going to take me back. And again, make sure you have saved it before you hit the Build button. Takes me back to my solution where I'll hit See All. This is the steps you'll do each time that you want to go back here. All right, once I've done that, we see Cloudflows right here. Now, Cloudflows are the workflow engine for Power Automate. When I click on Cloudflows, I'll hit the New button and go to Cloudflows, and I'll build an automated Cloudflow. Now, in this case, there's a number of flows we can do. Automated Cloudflows are essentially going to watch for some type of event to happen. And when that event happens, it will trigger some type of action. Instant flows are what you would do if we were kicking it off from the Power App. And then lastly, scheduled flows will be for like a month in processing or something like that. So let's do an automated flow. OK. Well, this, the zoom is a little goofy right now. There we go. Oh, no, so close. Let me try one more time. All right. There we go. All right, so let's call this flow, how about something like uh, uh, seek approval or seek contract approval or whatever you want to call it. It won't matter, okay? The trigger you want is going to be a Dataverse trigger. So search for Dataverse. Once you search for Dataverse, one of the pieces you're going to want is when a row is added, modified, or deleted. So you want to select this guy right here and then hit Create. So this is going to create our basic flow. And this flow is going to connect over to our Dataverse environment very easily. It's already connected in my case. We're going to configure this that whenever somebody adds a record, we're going to flip it over to In Review. And as soon as it goes to In Review, then we're going to seek approval for that record. So pretty simple steps we're going to knock out here. So to do that, I want to tell it what table to watch. The table I want to watch is for, I'm going to do, I'm looking for creation of records only, and I want to watch the contract table. You can type it in there if you're feeling especially useful, like I am right there. There we go. The scope 
is going to be organization. If anybody in my organization creates a record, I want to do this. Now, we can also uh, just briefly look at advanced options here. This would allow you right here where you see filter rows to look for like, like status columns. Like, for example, in, in, in a pseudocode here, it would be something like CR80 underscore, uh, I think it was like approval status, something like that. And then what you would do is you would say equals, uh, equals is the O data query here in this case, whatever the value is for that. So it'd be something like that, for example. That would be how you would look for things that are have been added of a certain value, okay? Select columns are how you can prevent infinite loops. So if, I have, if I'm looking for records to be updated of a certain type, then I do some updates down below, it creates an infinite loop. So select columns are how you can look for certain columns to be updated. All right. Also, it's a good idea to go ahead and select this little three dot right here and select a rename and go ahead and call it whatever you want. I'm going to call this contract table. And in my case, it's only looking for when rows are added. So I typically keep most of the name that you're seeing here, and then I'll put the table there as there. Well, well. why do I do that? Well. <laughs> I, I have this, this um, uh, probably inappropriate one here. I have this term called the two beer rule, right? That when something's going to break, it's going to break on a Friday night after you've had a few drinks in you. For me, it's two beers. For you, might be two glasses of wine or, or the kids are yelling or whatever. So when that happens, you're going to want to basically open this up and try to figure out what the heck were you thinking six months from now. So make sure you name these appropriately to handle that kind of event when that happens. Okay, so now I'm gonna go ahead and do a new step. This is also going to be a Dataverse step. So in this case, when, uh, if I look at, there's notice there's two Dataverses here, one is legacy and one is not legacy. So you have to kind of hover over it to confirm that you had the non-legacy one. The first one in my case, the non-legacy one. I'm gonna update a row, there it is. And I'm going to set back to my contract table again. Okay. There we go. I'm going to set the row to be equal to uh, the approval status here. I'm going to set that row to be equal to in review. So it's now gone from draft to in review. The, the row ID is the only mandatory thing that I need to set. And for that, I need the unique identifier that represents the primary key for that row. So what do you think that should be in the chat window? Let's see who gets uh, who gets this one right. So in my case, uh, you're, you guys are about 30 seconds behind me right now. When I select row ID, there we go, you'll see a list of all the columns. One of these columns is the right answer. Now I'm hovering over it here, but you'll see it says unique identifier for the instance entity. Here's your crib note here. If the table name, contract, is the same as the column name, contract, that's your unique identifier each time. So go ahead and select that contract, and there we go. So I'm going to update this, this, this contract to be equal to in review at this point. Okay. So I'll update a row, and I'll say something like set to in review. Okay, good enough. I'm also going to, going to want to use this later. So I'm going to select that three dot and I'll copy this to my clipboard so I can use it to either approve the record or reject the record later. So I'm going to hit copy the clipboard so I can do that later without having to write that code. Next, I'm going to hit new step and I'm going to search for approval. Now watch my flow checker right here. Right now it's all happy and go lucky. And when I select approvals and I look for start and wait for an approval, I want you to go ahead and select that if you're playing along at home. These other two options allow you to manufacture whatever type of approval you want and nag them and construct your own email, for example. This option right here simplifies the whole thing and it's basically the easy button. So when I do that, watch what happens. My flow checker just turned red. And when I go ahead and say start and wait for um, uh, an approval, I'm going to say uh, the first in that approves it wins. 
Now, this flow checker that I just mentioned a moment ago is saying that the software has not been installed yet. So as we're seeing right here, uh, when I run the first record through this, it's going to spend some time to basically go out there and install that software. Now, in make that power automate, for example, that might take about seven minutes to do that. In Teams, it's much slower to install that software. So the first time you run a record through that, you're going to think things are broken. And it might take 20, 25 minutes, potentially. But when you actually try to, um, to, to actually, when you finally give up on it, it will probably work. Just a mental note, be patient. That first record might take a while to come in. So we're going to design this now, but we're going to assume that we may never, at least on this recording, see the results of our work. Okay? But I'll show you what it could look like if we were doing this. All right. So, all right. So the good question here from Jim. Is there a way to complete the approval while using a post like an adaptive card in Teams? Absolutely. There actually is an adaptive card we're going to see here, but we can actually customize it we want and actually make it more adaptive and add more information to this. So for the time being, we're going to use this option. I'll show you what it looks like in a moment here, Jim. But we can also make it look a lot more adaptive, a lot more pretty, and do a lot more information in that adaptive card. We would not use the start and wait for an approval at that point. We would use the start approval, and then you can customize it to be whatever you wish. So now that we have that, first in wins. If the second person opens up this approval, it will basically say, hey, Brian's already approved it. All right. So uh, the title of this is going to be the title of the email that goes to the user. What happens when I send them an approval? Well, it is going to send them an email. It'll send them a notification on their phone. It will also send them a notification in Teams and on the website. So it sends them a nagging email all over the spot. Now, we can also customize that and add more types of things. But for my title of my email, I'm going to say, do you approve contract? And I'm going to do a mail merge. Look on the right. There's my contract number. And click on it. All right. Now we can also, notice it says update a row. If I look for contract number, we'll see contract number under update a row, as well as add a row. So it's the same thing in my case. Doesn't matter which one I choose it from. The assign to, I'm gonna type my email address here. And as I type it in, it should wake up and find me there. I can also do a, a, a separate that and, and add more than one email address with semicolons I wanted to as well, okay? The details are the body of your email. So I could say, you know, contract description and put like some, uh, some goodies in here. There we go. So you could put whatever you wish into this body of this email. Now, the link here is a link to what happens when a person wants to get more information. Do you want them to go to Teams? Do you want to go to Google or whatever? So for example, just for, for, the, for giggles here, I'm going to put like C record and I'm going to send them for the time being over just to, I don't know, bing.com, for example. But we can, we can also ultimately send them wherever you want. There's also something called deep linking where we can send them parameters where it opens up the application and allows them to go right to the record. And I do have some videos on that on our YouTube channel in case you're curious. All right. So next, uh, as we do this, let's go ahead and see the advanced options. You can do attachments. It will, of course, do notifications and, and allow, them to, allow them to actually reassign this record if you wanted to as well. I'm out of the office. I'm going to reassign this to Barb now in this case. <coughs> Excuse me. But now we're ready to, once they make this decision, we're going to route them one of two ways. Did the approver actually hit the word approve or reject? Now we can also go through here and read that value, read the email address out of a, a matrix of approvers. What I oftentimes see is, hey, what department is this contract for? The CFO approves all the finance contracts. The CIO approves all the uh, IT contracts and so on and so on. So you could build this conditional. You could also say, hey, this, this contract's for over $500,000. It needs CEO approval after the CFO approval. So you can kind of build a chain of, of, of custody there as well if you wanted to. All right. So I'm going to hit new step, and I want to route them one of two ways. 
you'll see right here, there is a condition. So go ahead and select that condition. You could also hit control and condition if you want as well. And this is gonna branch saying, did they approve or did they reject? The branch is gonna come in right here where I say, hey, the outcome of what you clicked on, of what the approver clicked on. So I'm gonna click on the word outcome. There it goes. So the outcome is equal to the word approve. Make sure it's, it's not past tense, approve, not approved. Uh, that's the word they clicked on in the email. And when they click on that word approve, it goes down this green path. If it's not that, it goes down the red path. So what we can do now is we can hit this add an action. And if we wanted to, we can go to the clipboard that you're seeing right here and click on that item from the clipboard. Now, a little bit of flaw, it goes through and it kind of collapses everything. I'm gonna do the same thing on the right side, clipboard, boom. And it, it normally it collapses it for you. All right, so I went ahead and pasted in both sides. If you did not add that to your clipboard, you can just hit the little three dot and hit copy to my clipboard, and then you can do the same thing I just did. Or you can always add it just like we did above. On the left side, let's go ahead and mark that as not in review, but instead it's now approved. On the right side, sorry, the, now the real right side, I, I'm learning my directions here, it's gonna be rejected. Now, additionally, on top of rejecting the record, that's interesting, my, my, my real ID is now on the left side for some reason. Let me, let me collapse it and come back. There it is. All right, weird UI thing. All right, so on the right side, I not only want to approve the re or reject the record, but I also want to log what comments somebody has filled in about this record. So if I click in here, you're gonna see on the right side, let me kind of scroll a little bit to the right, I'm gonna look for uh, uh, comments. There it is, responses, comments. Now, because there can be more than one responder, when I click on that, it's gonna turn it into a loop. Now, in my case, only the first one wins, but it doesn't know that I only had one approver. You can optionally do the same thing on the, on the left side. Approval comments and look for comments. There it is, and then click on response comments. It turns it into a loop. So now I have, I'm now logging each step along the way. I'm gonna mark this as rejected on the right side, approve on the left side, and I'm gonna log the, any kind of comments they may have added as well. I'm gonna hit the save button to go ahead and save my now approval process, and now we're ready to go in and try this out. We could hit the test button to start this process out, but I'm gonna go ahead and go back to my app and kick it off that way. Mental note that this is not going, this is error right, this, not error, this warning right here is letting me know to prepare for disappointment. It might take some time for it to install this component, but let's get it kicked off here and see if it works. After you have it the first time, subsequent records after installation will be much, much faster. Now, if I wanna try this, I can go back to build and try it that way by, by preview mode, or if I'm feeling especially frisky, I can go to my application, go to contract management. I will see, because I published the application recently. Again, I'm still on designer. Because I'm a designer, it might spin for a while here. Uh, I could also open up the website. Oh, there it goes. I just had to kind of wait impatiently here. Uh, and I'll enter uh, my bad contract. It is for Nate's Crappy Cars, Inc. I'm a sponsor, $55, a one-star review. And of course, I would wanna remove these comments, but that's fine, and I'll hit save. That will trigger my flow to run. And if I happen to go back to Power Apps again, we'll see it starting to run under the build icon. There's my Learn the Nerds. I'll hit see all, and there it is, seek contract approval. We'll start to see it here uh, kicked off. So I'll go seek, uh, there it is. So it created my connections, it created my approval. And when I click on this, we'll see it running now. It might take a little while for it to kick off the first time. So in a moment here, there it is, it is running. And when I click on this, it's gonna show me hopefully 
that it's waiting now for installing the software. So it's actually kicked off right here and it's waiting. But we can see the records that were passed in. We can go down here as well and actually see that it's been set to in review. Matter of fact, if I were to go back to my build icon and go back to my application, we'll see it now in a review status now. So it's gonna be that third record over here. If I click on my app, there's my app right there. We can see that um, that we're getting close to having the review status. By the way, we are rounding the finish line right now. So if you have questions, go ahead and ask them in the chat window, and we'll have some time to actually answer some questions that throughout this. Oh, sorry, this is a different uh, application. So you can see how pretty these can look as you kind of build out other stuff here. Uh, that was an accident there. Let me go back here again. I went the wrong team site. And let me go back over to learn with the nerds and back to my application again. There we go. Okay, cool. So this use case is a very common use case. This use case is one where you put things into a queue, somebody works a queue, and then it comes out and you can see the results of that queue also. Now, there are lots of things we have access to in here. Once it comes open, you'll see now I have two items in review. So as I add this stuff in, let me go add one more item. All right, boom, 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 hit submit. All right, right now it's yellow. And if I were to click away from it, like hit the pencil icon here and come back here, we're gonna see that, that eventually this will turn red also. Now, it's not, there's nothing triggering the refresh yet. If I were to hit the pencil icon on the right side, I would see the correct value. Um, but if I want to manually trigger a refresh, I can just hit that little three dot right here and select refresh, and we'll see it turns into blue at that point. We can also programmatically do that by adding an icon. You don't have to do this. I'm going to add a little refresh icon, a reload icon. There it is. I can add a little reload icon somewhere in my environment maybe at the bottom or whatnot, there we go, if I wanted to. And that reload can also do it. That's just a, a simple command of refresh. And then what table do you want to refresh? My contracts table. Now the refresh happens automatically when you add records, but in this case over here, it had no way of knowing the status has changed. If I were to hit the pencil icon and I had that flag over here, we would have seen it on the right side. But because I did it this way, we're not seeing it. Let me go ahead and open up my inbox now, and I should hopefully get an email in the next five minutes or so also. Uh, I hate opening up my email in the middle of a session because it stresses me out because I, I see about 100 emails coming in. All right, but regardless now, the last thing I wanna show is I might want to give the ability to cancel the, 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 this, uh, this update here also. We're making great time. So let's go show a few more little bonus points that we can do. So I'm going to go ahead and insert another button. There we go. Move it wherever I want. Of course, I would normally make this button a red button to kind of signify it's a cancel. There we go. Put whatever you want. I'm going to call mine cancel. And then I will make this a 14 font or also. Is that, is that 14 font? No, I think it's 12 font. I forgot what I did there. And I'll make it bold. All right, good enough. So call it whatever you want. Now, in this case, if you want to put a cancel button in here, it's as simple as looking at the on select button here. Okay. There we go, oh, on select, there we go. And I wanna do two things. I want to basically, I, I, wanna, I wanna reset the form back to new mode. There we go, I wanna reset the form. Oh, uh, sorry, reset form, sorry, reset form right there. What form do you want to reset? I want to reset form one. And I also want to make sure just for good measure that I am in new form as well. Perfect. So those two commands right there, watch what happens when I hold down the alt key. I could hit the play button, but one thing I forgot to show earlier is I hold down the alt key, I can hit cancel and it wipes out that data. So as I go back and forth while I'm holding the alt key down, hit cancel, it goes back to new mode again. So a great question we have here from a few folks here. I'm glad you guys are queuing these up. And Nate, any, any good ones that you want to queue up, please go ahead and put those in my, uh, my uh, queue here in the banner, and I'll start to answer those uh, as we're starting to wrap up today's session here. So one great question was from Tom. 
what happens when an app uh, when the app creator leaves the organization? So there's two things you can do. Uh, if you're an owner of the team with Tom, for example, we both can still edit the application or both the co-owner of the application. However, there's also PowerShell scripts you can run to basically go through and, and assign, uh, assign a new primary owner to it. Additionally, alternatively as well, there's something called the Center of Excellence Toolkit. I'll open that up in a second, Tom, to show you what I mean. But uh, let me see here. I think I've got one already open. There we go. Let me go over to my Center of Excellence Toolkit. And I'm gonna answer this a little bit more uh, robustly here for you, Tom. All right, so if I go over to here, one of the apps when you install the Center of Excellence Toolkit is App Permissions. And it does all the stuff I just talked about, all the, oh, okay. It's not gonna, it's not gonna be, find it easily there. So we go to Apps in the environment and there's one called App Permissions here. There it is, Set App Permissions. So when I click on this, uh, Tom, what this will do for you is allows you to reassign this. This is an app from Microsoft where you can go and select any kind of app you wish. And let me find one of Nate's apps here. I think I've got one in my mock-up environment. There we go. Uh, this one right here, Gamify Classroom. This one is actually an orphaned one. So I could go through and actually reassign the permissions here. I can also find any orphaned apps. And on those orphaned apps, I can go ahead and, and select it and add permissions to myself to where I am now the owner of it. Again, you can do this in PowerShell, but this is an app that you can install for free. It's called the Center of Excellence Toolkit to knock that out. Oh, would you believe it? I just got an approval. So here's the first piece. See the record, it goes to bing.com. In the background, oh, do you believe it? I got an approval of the email also. So as I look at this, I can go ahead and hit the reject button and say, because I don't like you, I can do it in my email, in Outlook, in Teams, on my phone, whatever I wish. And when I hit submit, that record, 1004, is going to proceed. Now, for every subsequent record, oh, I got another one. For that next record that came in, came through super fast, we can see that it's been rejected. The next record, uh, next flow already came in as well, so we can keep on going. Additionally, if I were to go back over to Teams here, we're going to see that that record now should be should have a red background on it as well. Additionally, by the way, there is also an approval center on the left side. This is where you can see all the approvals for each individual environment and what's in your queue right now to approve. So if I click on that, we can see that uh, for this personal productivity environment, here's all the stuff I've got. But if I go over to the environment we've been in today, which I think is to learn with the nerds, uh, here are all the approvals I have. And here's who approved it, here's who rejected it. You can also see DocuSign stuff here and, and Adobe Sign stuff here as well. But again, uh, back to my app here, which is in Teams, there we go. This will take a few seconds. I think I'm still in designer mode, so it's still spinning because of that. But ultimately now, the record has now been updated and it now has a red icon on it, not a blue icon or a, or a golden icon now. So I'll just open up, I think I've got my Teams open in the background. There we go. If I were to hit uh, refresh on this, let's go out and come back. I should do it. Oh, let me just refresh. So uh, by refreshing, I'm getting all the latest metadata out and it should now give me the, the latest application. There we go. And well, okay, now this is interesting. You might have to hit control refresh sometimes when you get this to make sure you get all the latest metadata. So it's been cached for performance and that's why it gave me the wrong app back. There we go, there's my red and we can see I can't actually, I cannot edit that application anymore also. All right, excellent. So let's start. Uh, Nate, would you mind start copying some questions into the banner for us so we can start to answer those? I see. Oh, I see my next my next record just came in. So once you have those that record in, you'll see there's my next approval coming in. I can go ahead and this time I'm going to um, I'm going to forward this over to somebody else, or I can just go ahead and approve it inside Teams this time, and there it goes. So that's been approved. I got notice in Teams, and then back in the Teams area 
we'll see that the contract app, it loads up and that's now green. Awesome. So you built a pretty comprehensive app over the next, over the last hour to two hours and a half here. Amazing job. Hopefully you're pausing me along the way and, and trying to build yourself. Of course, this is being recorded as well. We're gonna answer some questions here for a little bit here uh, to make sure we've got some good stuff here. Let's start with a question from Victoria. What happens, and I'm gonna go ahead and just go full screen here. What if you wanna share this externally? As of right now, as of October right now at least, the person would have to have a full license of Teams to see your application. So Victoria, they would have to have access uh, to your Office 365 license to share that externally as of right now. They can keep their email address, but they must be licensed. So that's, that's why that, that it does not work right now. Alternatively, though, Victoria, you can use uh, like Power Portals if you wanted to, to our Power, Power Pages now it's called, to ultimately allow your users to see that data externally if you wanted to as well. All right, so we got some other ones here. Uh, the next one, is there a way to sync up the approval feature in Teams with approving a task in ServiceNow? Unfortunately, I don't know ServiceNow well enough, uh, but there is, if there's an API, you can do it. Of course, if it's Seek, Sword and SQL Server, you can do it as well. I've done that for things like SharePoint and other systems, but I have not done it here as well. So you can, you can, you potentially can do it. Whether they charge you or not, I don't know on that one. So that's that's a good question. Unfortunately, I don't know the answer to that one. So from Sean, with the Center of Excellence app, can you assign a security-enabled Outlook distribution group as the owner? Unfortunately, the owner is an individual, so you cannot you cannot do that. But uh, you you can uh, make co-owners in the application if you wanted to. Uh, at least at the time of this recording, again, uh, that date that data always gets outdated fast here. All right, question here: Can you print out a gallery search results? What a great question! So there is a command. There's actually a number of commands you have. Uh, let me go back to my Power Apps area one more time. Get back to build again and open up the application. Oh, and I went out of focus again. There it goes. All right, so to, to the, to the so this is a question from uh, Boston Career Institute. All right, so once this opens up, uh, there is a command called print. So what you basically do is you create a print preview screen where it looks just like what you want. Let me show you how we would do that if you, if you, if you wanted to knock that out. So I would create a blank screen, almost like a print preview screen in this case, once this opens up. All right, give it a few seconds. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, and create a new screen. It'll be a blanker in this case. And what I'm gonna do is I'll, I, you can do a number of ways of this. I can actually, uh, under insert, you can put a data card, the table here. I can also just put my gallery back in here. All right, a vertical gallery. Okay, and, and kind of lay it out however you want. In this case, my data source for this, I'm going to point back to gallery one dot all items. So give me all the items from whatever you search. So in other words, if I go over to here and I play this and I search for um, uh, bad, for example. All right. So check this out. And then I go back over to screen three here. It just says my bad contract. So it knows whatever I have filtered down in one screen will show up here. Then I can drop a button in of some sort. All right. And that button will just have the on select code. Okay, we drill down here on select. There we go. So we just type in the word print. And then all I need is that print command like this. Let me make sure I save this before I do anything at all. I'll then play this. And then when I click on this, it goes into print preview mode and it will look like whatever the screen looks like now. So it'll have just whatever I have. That's the easy answer. Uh, of course, you can make this design it look to where it look a lot prettier. But in this case, um, it, it is what it is, right? There's also a command coming out any day now, and it is called PDF. Oh, I think it's out now. Check this out. So I can go and convert screen three, hot breaking news. This was not out here just yesterday. You point to what screen you want to turn into a PDF. Let's all click on it. 
Let's see what happens. Oh, and I got an error. All right. Well, I announced this at the conference, and you'll notice that right now the feature has not been enabled. Okay, the PDF feature has not been enabled, so it probably is under settings here under upcoming features. Let me search for PDF. Oh, look at that. Ho, ho, ho. That was not there yesterday, by the way, even last night. So if I save this again, hit that button. Okay. It uh, oh, cannot be the current, must be the current screen. Okay, no problem. Let's fix that problem. Let's make this screen. What am I on now? Screen two. All right. And hit that button. And in my other screen, Adobe just opened up. So awesome. So it looks like the print preview screen. So there's a number of ways we can do that. That was something announced at a conference recently. They've just added as of today. It wasn't there last night. Now there. I've been waiting for it to show up now. Now, this might be something they generally put stuff in Teams first, and they get it working in that interface first. If it works well, they port it over to Power Apps for Teams next. So they test it in one before they go out to the next one also. All right, so other questions we have uh, from Shinrick. Uh, can we have a single app to manage all the apps in Power Apps? Well, that's essentially what the Center of Excellence does for you. It's an app that Microsoft has created for you to manage all the permissions, all the app owners, the orphan records. So all that is done as part of the Center of Excellence toolkit. You'll be able to find in my previous webinar I did, the center, I, did, I covered the Center of Excellence as well as how do you add governance around this whole platform. It's about an hour and a half webinar we did on learn, lunch with the nerds in that case, uh, where we covered that piece. Uh, can an app? Can a Teams app create an app for oh, sorry? Can a Teams app create an app for Teams they are not a member of? Okay, they have to be uh, uh, have to be an owner of a team to be able to create an app inside there. I think that's your question, and if I missed that, I apologize. There. All right. Uh, yes, it is possible. A Center of Excellence Toolkit. Is there a way to publish? This is a question here. Is there a way to publish a Teams app also as a regular app? or copying over new the app way? Yes, so this is a great question from uh, Gaiman. So there are two ways we can do Teams applications. One is the, what, the way we've been covering today. The other way is I hit this little plus button right here, and I can search for Power Apps. This, now I'm in my team now, right? So I'm in my team, I hit the little plus button, and I'm gonna search for Power Apps. Now when I do that, it's going to show me my environments, my non Power Apps for Teams environments. See, there's my environments uh, right here where I can search for whatever app I want to do. And I'll just do this one right here, for example. Whether it's a model driven app or a Canvas app, I can hit save and it's going to create that admin app right inside of this team also. So these are apps that are in make.powerapps.com where this app is hosted in Teams. This app is, is hosted in the main Power Apps environment. Hopefully that was your question. If I missed your question, please correct me if I'm wrong. All right, how do you display an app in a website? So when you open up a certain page, like this one right here, for example, uh, on your phone, there'll be a button, a little dot, dot, dot next to your button. And um, when you do that, oh, I'm not, I'm not seeing the button here, but on your phone or tablet device, in the Teams application, there is a button to basically open up that app in a web page instead. So if you don't want to go through Teams, you can do that as well as well there. All right, great question. Uh, Kelly, let's see if I can answer this one. When modifying a form in Flow that's already in production, how does it affect the flow that's already in progress, not yet complete? Great question. It does not need to restart. Those ones that are already in progress, those flows that are already in progress will continue to run with the old metadata. But the new ones will run with a new metadata instead. So that, as of right now, at least, that's the way it behaves. So it will not hurt the ones that are already there, but any subsequent runs will take the new one. All right. Uh, okay. Lots of good questions here. Uh, so can any person with Teams get, get the app if... I add them as a Teams member. Yes, absolutely. So anybody that's a team member right now of this team, if I were to add Nate as in this team right now, uh, he would be able to see access, he would access this application very, very easily. There is a governance white paper coming out any day now from Microsoft, which will have a whole bunch of information about how you can do additional security on there 
and how you can also govern this information as well. All right, Nate, I think, uh, first of all, Nate, I'm gonna add you back. Would you mind turning your camera back on, Nate? So great job helping me out today, Nate. Nate uh, I'm gonna add you back in here as well. So, hey, there you are. Well, I sort of. <laughs> so there he is. All right, so if you have seen in the chat win that chat window, power the people. Uh, that is my coworker, Nate, here. Thank, uh, thank you so much, Nate, for, uh, for playing along and answering the hundreds of questions I saw in the chat window. Believe it or not, today is Nate's PTO day. And uh, he, he, he was uh, kind enough to, to, uh, to come and help us today on this. All right, so really quickly here, uh, again, if you go to the, um, um, the, the website pragmaticworks.com, You'll see the, the you, can, you can check out. There's a 50% off code called L, LWTN50. It's in the in the bottom uh, right below us scrolling right now. So that code will get you 50% off our on-demand learning for just a few days here. Uh, additionally, if this really interested you, we do things like hackathons where we'll teach you how to fish with your own example. Nate and I do these almost uh, almost every few days. Uh, we do another hackathon with another company, uh, building on a power app with your own data. And then lastly, if you get stuck, you can always uh, we have a thing called virtual mentoring where we help you get unstuck in a half an hour, two hours, based on how much time you want. Well, guys, I'm going to give you 10 minutes back. Uh, we have a lot of questions coming in. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, the question here about Excel, the, 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 um, the piece we showed for the PDF is brand new. It's only PDF right now. And if you want to go to Excel, you can use things like Power Automate to go to Excel. Hey, Nate, my friend, thank you for helping out. And thank you for joining us today on this uh, Learn with the Nerd session. Have a great day. Thank, thank you so you, much. Everyone. Thanks for the great questions. Bye, everyone.